सर प्लीज स्टार्ट Namrata, can we start? Yes, uh, I think uh, I would like to welcome all the uh, international faculty to this webinar. This is the first international webinar on, on ocular oncology from the platform of uh, the All India Ophthalmological Society. And we are a society of 21,000 ophthalmologists, which is the largest society of the life members of the uh, ophthalmology. We have with us today a galaxy of speakers. Uh, Dr. Santosh Hunavar has coordinated this uh, webinar and we have uh, people from all over the world. Just like we all are uh, globally uh, together in this pandemic of Corona, today we are also together on this uh, webinar uh, for the purpose of uh, education of our uh, members uh, all over the world. So we would like to welcome uh, Dr. Tim Sullivan from Australia, Dr. Carol Shields, uh, Dr. Carol Karp, my very good friend, and Dr. Paul Finger from USA, uh, Dr. Ashwin Reddy from Moorfields, and Dr. Sachin Salvi from Sheffield. And uh, we would also like to welcome Dr. Uh, Francis from Switzerland, and Dr. Higard from Denmark could not join us today. And our very own uh, uh, Oncologists, uh, Dr. Santosh Hanwavar, of course, Dr. Shanmugam, Dr. Vikas Khetan, Dr. Kostam Malay, and Dr. Uh, Reddy. And we are, uh, our members have logged into this webinar, and we are Facebook Live, and we are YouTube Live. So uh, thank you for uh, making it happen, Santosh, and thank you for all of, all of our speakers. Uh, I know it's a different time in all parts of the world, and uh, it's very well coordinated that all have found time at this point at this point uh, to be together for the purpose of uh, for the purpose of education so i would now request our president uh, dr maipal sachdev who's uh, the guiding uh, light for all for all of us uh, at the all india ophthalmological society and under whose leadership the society continues to flourish to say a few words thank you very much dr namta and in the first instance i'll wish to thank all the international and national faculty who have uh, come together under the umbrella of all india ophthalmological society to do this uh, webinar i think uh, ocular oncology of thermoplasty they are uh, really branches which are coming up and uh, they there is so much of development that has happened that the members would always want to keep abreast with all these development uh, we have already a record uh, uh, number of people who have logged in already for this uh, webinar. And I'm sure that with such a galaxy of speakers who are uh, joined us from different parts of the world, 
uh, we would uh, uh, be able to give the members of all india ophthalmological society a lot of information and a lot of uh, new dimensions into diagnosis and management of these tumors uh, we have uh, within india a very very vibrant all india ophthalmological society and uh, which has several specialty organizations uh, which are affiliated to the all india ophthalmological society all india ophthalmological society does uh, a lot of uh, activities and in this uh, uh, present covid era i think webinars have become uh, something which all of us are taking uh, uh, as a route to keep ourselves engaged and to uh, enrich ourselves in the knowledge uh, fields of various parts of ophthalmology as also the administrative uh, uh, ways and how to get back to practice, etc. Once we are over with this COVID problem, so I think uh, thank you very much, all of you, for uh, being here, and thank you very much for all the uh, delegates and uh, members of AIOS and from across the world who have logged in. So, without much ado, I think we can start with the uh, webinar, and this is going to be really very very interesting. Look forward to a great academic feast. And uh, it's going to be close to about two and a half to three hours, and uh, we will be taking questions. So all of you who are listening can put in their questions, and uh, they can also specify as to whom they want to ask this uh, uh, question from. And we will uh, then have the questions uh, read out by the panelists, and uh, we can uh, take it forward from there. So welcome through this webinar, and uh, uh, please uh, let us uh, have it rolling forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sachdev. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Carol Sheets, who is uh, chairing this session. She will uh, briefly introduce the subject of uh, ocular oncology for a general ophthalmologist. Why should they know about tumor sacral? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to chair this session. I'd like to welcome all of you to the Ocular Oncology Webinar Festival. From all corners of the world, we will be hearing from experts regarding tumors and cancers of the eyelids, conjunctiva, orbit, and intraocular structures. We'll talk about sebaceous carcinoma and ocular surface squamous neoplasia, retinoblastoma, uveal melanoma, imaging, the importance of pathology, and tumor genetics. We will hear from leaders from Australia, India, United States, Switzerland, Denmark, all working together for you in this program. So why learn about ocular oncology? Well, there's no doubt about it. Eye cancer is scary. Imagine being told that there's a cancer in your eye or behind your eye, and it risks your sight and your life. Imagine the fear of blindness and death. And that is what we deal with every day in our practices. There is no doubt that experienced ocular oncologist can make a difference in a patient's life. Heroic progress has been made in the management of many intraocular and extraocular cancers over the past 20 years, particularly with retinoblastoma, early detection of melanoma, photodynamic therapy for choroidal metastasis, checkpoint inhibitors for conjunctival melanoma, and on and on. So sit back and enjoy the healthy discussions that we're going to have and the cutting edge uh, presentations from all four corners of our planet Earth, now that it's one day after Earth Day. Special thanks to Dr. Santosh Hanavar for organizing this exciting webinar. It is an honor to share the podium with him. So to those of you in America, good morning. In Europe, good afternoon. In India, good evening. Let's turn on the engines and get on with the show. Thank you. faculty next. Not that they need introduction, but of course, it's always good to know about them. Okay. So Carol Shields is uh, chairing this session. She is my teacher and mentor and whatever I'm uh, today is because of Jerry and Carol uh, who uh, taught me. It was 20 years ago when I was a fellow with them. She is currently the director of oncology service at Vilsai Hospital. She has offered or authored over a dozen of textbooks, over 330 chapters and 1,800 articles. We struggled to have one tenth of that and she has published 1,800 articles already. She has 
uh, obviously a long uh, career ahead of her. She was the past president of International Society of uh, Ocular Oncology and was awarded the American Academy of Ophthalmology Life Achievement Honor Award in 2011 and is the first woman to receive the Donders Award. And the good news is that for 20, she has been voted as the most individual proud to have. The talks, uh, Prof. Prof. Tim Sullivan uh, is the first to go. He is from University of Queensland, Brisbane, in Australia. He is the past president of the Australia and New Zealand Society of Ophthalmic Plastic Surgery and the Asia Pacific Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. He specializes in eyelid, orbital, and lacrimal diseases, but has a special interest in eyelid and orbital oncology. Virus PM is from Forest Speciality Eye Care, Bangalore, India, and she has been the fellow with Dr. Shields, and also she was uh, my fellow. Uh, so she is actually Dr. Shields' grand fellow. Uh, health, she was a, she is a currently a healthcare entrepreneur and a passionate teacher. She has received, received the American Academy of Ophthalmology Achievement Award, APO Achievement Award, and was the AIO's International Hero in 2018. She is also an international faculty in retinoblastoma in China. And she has been, she hasn't been to China for a long time now. So she is Prof. Carol Karp is from Bascom Pharma Eye Institute, Miami, Florida. She is oncology, specifically ocular surface famous neoplasia and melanocytic ocular surface tumors. She has pioneered imaging of the ocular surface uh, in terms of high resolution uh, OCT and also topical treatment for ocular surface chemist neoplasia. She is an excellent teacher with a wonderful presentations that we look forward to. Ashwin Reddy is from Moorfields Eye Hospital, London, UK, and he heads the retinoblastoma services there. In fact, he is the face of retinoblastoma management in the United Kingdom. He has multiple peer-reviewed articles on major ophthalmic journals, specifically on retinoblastoma, and has active interest in teaching. Uh, professor Francis Munia is from uh, Switzerland. He is the professor and head of ocular oncology, pathology, and genetics there. He pioneered the management of intravitreal chemotherapy in retinoblastoma. And everything that we know today about vitreous seeds and their management is uh, attributable to Professor Munia. Mahesh Shanmugam is a friend and he is the head of uh, vitreoretinal and oncology service at Shankaranitra, Shankara Eye Hospital in Bangalore. He was a early successful retinet India and he is one of the leading authorities in ocular oncology in India. And his main focus is currently on multimodal uh, imaging of intraocular tumors. Paul Finger is a collaborator and a friend. He's from New York Eye Cancer Center, New York, uh, US. He's the chair of, of Ophthalmic Oncology Task Force of the American Joint Committee on Cancer. He's uh, credited to have first used Palladium 103 seeds in ophthalmic plaque. And he's uh, invented several devices, including fingers, slotted eye plaques, and a specific probe for cryotherapy. Sachin is again a close friend. He is currently uh, head, uh, head of the Department of Ocular Oncology in uh, Sheffield, uh, UK. He specializes in lacrimal and orbital surgeries, oculoplasty and oncology. And he is one of the select few ocular oncologists in the United Kingdom. He is one of the co-members who formulated the UK cricket. Professor Higard uh, couldn't be here today, but uh, not to miss introducing him. He is a professor of uh, Eye Pathology Institute, University of Copenhagen, uh, Denmark. He has extensive experience in ophthalmic pathology. He is an authority on orbital and axial lymphoma. Dr. Vijanand Reddy is a close associate. We have been working together for almost 20 years. He is uh, the ex-president of Association of Radiation Oncologists of India, chairman of Indian Society of Oncology, and uh, is a pioneer of medical protocols and radiation techniques for the treatment of intraocular and extraocular tumors in India. 
Faustuk Mule is again a colleague on Center for Science Hyderabad. He is the head of National Reporting Center for Ophthalmic Pathology and has special interest in interest in ocular oncopathology. Vikas Khetha is from Shankaranetra Lab, Chennai, India. He specializes in vitreoretinal surgery and has uh, immense interest in intraocular tumors and genetics of intraocular tumors. He is the recipient of prestigious Shiva Reddy International Award of All India Ophthalmological Society. So that concludes the introduction. I have uh, one more uh, thing to share. That's about a surprise quiz that we have for uh, the viewers. I will just share the rules very quickly so that uh, they can get going. Uh, this is powered by Dr. Patho Pratham um, uh, from Shankaranetralia. He's a consultant there. He is coordinating the back end of the quiz. There'll be 12 questions after each uh, talk. Actually, we have uh, one question which may not be related to the talk at all. Each question will have four possible answers for the uh, viewers to choose from A, B, C, and D. Answer must be sent to the WhatsApp number. This is the number that you can see on the screen 917 within five minutes after the question is asked. You have to message your name and affiliation first to register before you send in the answers. Once the time is the response is considered invalid. One who gets most uh, gift, that's an autograph ocular oncology at last by Dr. Shields, which I've announced without taking up permission, but I'm sure she will oblige. And consolation prizes will be Kindle Unlimited subscription for a year. So. That's it, so we can uh, move forward. I request Dr. Shields to take over. Okay, thank you. Our first speaker will be from Australia. Uh, this will be Dr. Tim Sullivan, and he will be speaking on targeted therapy of eyelid mal malignancies. I'm sure this will be a great up-to-date talk for all of us to learn from. Tim? We, we should tell Tim to turn off his mute button. Admin, uh, ad, admin is there. Admin, can you please coordinate? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I think it's been turned off now. I'll continue. <clears throat> Uh, my topic tonight is to talk about therapy of eyelid malignancies that is actually targeted. And this is an exciting topic. But before I do that, I would just like to acknowledge the enormity of the COVID-19 pandemic, all those who have lost their lives to the virus, and thank everyone involved at all levels, the medical, nursing, and other workers in the front line. And there will probably be many changes that come on from this unfortunate situation that we'll, we, we will adopt permanently as a result, perhaps something like this webinar. Now, periocular malignancy is something we see every day and sometimes it is straightforward, but it can be very complicated. We have a number of common eyelid tumors and some which we don't see that often. <laughs> Can we have the slide share, please? Tim, you have to share your screen. Yeah, the, sc the slides have to be shared on the screen. I'm, I apologize. Is that being shared now? Yeah, and please, yeah. can you put it? Yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, I apologize about that. It was, uh, okay. So mm -hmm. um, I was commencing with my thanks uh, to the organization and uh, mentioning the enormity of the COVID pandemic, uh, the people who have lost their lives and the staff who have been in the front line. 
and how the changes from the pandemic will remain with us forever. Teleconsultations, uh, webinars, those sorts of things. Now, periocular malignancy can be relatively straightforward, but it can also be very complicated. We have a number of eyelid tumors that we see, basal cell carcinoma, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, sebaceous carcinoma, melanoma, Merkel cell tumors, and many more rare tumors. But all of these actually share common tumor pathways. And most of these pathways work by mechanisms where they avoid apoptosis. They sustain proliferative signaling. They try to gain replicative immortality. They evade growth suppressors, and this leads to an induction of angiogenesis, um, invasion, and metastasis. If we look at BCCs, the aberrant hedgehog signaling um, pathway drives BCC formation, and that is facilitated by the WENT and the NOTCH pathways, and the mTOR and HIPPO are also involved. With SCC, um, epithelial growth factor is one an important pathway. P53, the RAS oncogenes, these are all important pathways. The basia is a little bit more difficult. Uh, it has many of the same pathways, but it also involves the RB1 mutations, um, various um, WENT and BCATN pathways, and of course, the DNA mismatch repair enzymes that link this into the Muir Tor syndrome, MLH. MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2. Melanoma, it adopts similar pathways to the other tumors which have been um, utilized in targeted therapy management. Merkel cell is a little bit more difficult. It has a, a, a lesser understanding of its pathways, but interestingly, there is a, a, a viral vector uh, the Merkel cell polyoma virus, which is involved in 80% of um, virus positive Merkel cells around the world, except for Australia, where the percentage is reversed. And we have 80% virus negative Merkel cells. Uh, and that's because of our UV exposure. Now, targeted therapy is treatment that is directed to identify and attack specific cancer cells, but with less damage to normal cells. Generally, it will act by blocking enzymes, proteins, molecules that are involved in the growth or spread of cancer cells, and it enhances the immune system to actively kill cancer cells. And compared to our standard um, chemotherapy agents, it's a better treatment with fewer side effects. Most commonly, these are small molecule inhibitors. And interestingly, these small molecules have a short half-life and require an oral administration, usually daily. In theory, they should be cheaper uh, than most other agents because it's a standard chemical process to manufacture them. Also, they're actively metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system, so they're broken down quickly. So that's why they need to have generally a daily dose. Whereas monoclonal antibodies have a longer half-life they're denatured in the gastrointestinal system. They require IV administration and they avoid cytochrome P450 metabolism. And unfortunately, they're more expensive because of the expensive um, bioengineering that is required to make them. And there are also kinase inhibitors and other agents that contribute to the targeted therapy spectrum. We all have a normal immune response and this essentially has two signals and um, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, the CTLs, protein binds to the um, major histocompatibility molecule. CD28 binds with a number of ligands, CD80 or 86, and that is on the target cell. But to get a sustained, robust response to target cell death, cytokine secretion, and the formation of memory cells, that second <laughs> stage needs to be developed. Now, there are also inhibitory CTLA4 and PD or program death checkpoints that can turn this important process off. So checkpoint inhibitors, which we now use, turn this process back on. And chimeric antigen receptor target cells or therapy causes, this antigen, causes an antigen-driven cell death. 
And this is very important in battling cancer today. There are a number of drugs targeting the hedgehog pathway, but the two that have become FDA approved are vismotigib and sunitigib, small molecule SMO inhibitors. They have a profound metastatic and local um, response, but unfortunately, both of them do have side effects well, which can um, uh, cause problems with the use. The reason that vismotigib is so important around the eye is that it can save eyes that would be otherwise lost. And this has been highlighted by Alon Kahana, Beta Esmaili, and other groups uh, who have demonstrated this. This is a gentleman who on slide left uh, has an extensive basal cell carcinoma invading his orbit. And on slide right, we can see the amazing immune response three months after commencing vismotigib. We can see on the um, MRI slide left, uh, the extensive uh, medial canthal orbital involvement, which has largely disappeared on slide right. This lady had a recurrent basal cell carcinoma of the um, left lower eyelid invading the orbit extensively. Here she is in February 2018 before treatment. This is the aggressive, invasive, morphaic pathology. She was commenced on vismotigib. The tumour began to shrink. And in November 2018, was much smaller and led to a decision to proceed with a, a globe sparing operation where we excised the tumour, obtained clear margins and reconstructed the defect. The histology post vismotigib, however, was still quite active with a high um, chi-67 uh, ratio and fairly aggressive mitotic pathology. And I think that highlights that many people feel that vismotigib is a, back, is a um, tumor um, static drug rather than a tumorocidal. And here she is uh, following her repair. We've recently published um, in an international series, uh, a small number of patients, 13, uh, a number of which were mine, uh, seven of whom had orbital involvement. 40% had a complete response to this treatment. 60% had a partial response, but almost everyone had significant side effects that caused them to stop the drug in many cases. Six patients went on to have further surgery. Three, fortunately, were globe sparing procedures, but unfortunately, three patients still needed exaggeration. If we move now to squamous cell carcinoma, um, targeted therapy has a role here too. Um, epithelial growth factor is a transmembrane receptor protein strongly expressed by SCC. Cetuximab is a monoclonal antibody which inhibits the downstream kinase activation, whereas alotinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And more, a more recently developed drug, uh, simiplumab, inhibits PD-1, program death one. This is one of Beta Ismaili's patients who showed a good response to alotinib. I have not used this myself, uh, but we have experience with uh, simiplumab uh, in um, metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. This gentleman had extensive metastatic disease. Uh, this is him uh, three years ago. He's still alive today uh, with resolution of his metastatic disease on simiplumab. This patient uh, had extensive recurrent intraorbital disease, post maximal dose radiotherapy with radionecrosis, uh, and his top. CT scans show uh, the, the tumour pre and three months post simiplumab. Similarly, his PET scan, uh, this is his clinical appearance after that, his PET scan in the upper images show the pre appearance here and the post appearance below. Melanoma is a slightly different story. We tend not to use these uh, drugs, checkpoint inhibitors, or targeted therapy for primary lesions, 
But this woman had a, uh, an extensive metastatic lesion and she's about to start some of the um, uh, checkpoint inhibitors for this disorder. With regards to Merkel cell, um, program death L1 expression has been shown, PD1 expression has been shown in Merkel cell carcinomas and both um, avalumab and pembrolizumab have been approved for this by the FDA with good results. Um, these are the melanoma pathways. My slides are a little out of order. I apologize for that. Uh, and in terms of checkpoint inhibitors, there are a number that are used. Um, um, generally, ipilimumab is used initially uh, and um, Pembro and Nevo and Devro are used subsequently. This gentleman had a large Merkel cell carcinoma and while he did well with local resection, he had extensive metastatic disease. He started pembrolizumab in March of 2018 and is still alive and well as of last month. So in essence, in a short period of time, I've tried to um, take you through a number of the different targeted therapies for eyelid malignancy, which have applications in of our most common tumor, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, less so, less so at this stage in, in sebaceous carcinoma, but importantly in metastatic melanoma and Merkel cell carcinoma. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in the All India Ophthalmic Society Ocular Oncology webinar. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Tim. That was an excellent overview of a constantly evolving topic. All the various checkpoint inhibitors uh, and their application to various eyelid malignancies. Our next uh, speaker will be Dr. Farooz Manjandavida. She no, uh, hails from, do we want questions first? Yeah, I, I have a, one quiz question and then uh, Paul ha has a parallel meeting. So he wants to do next and... Uh... Go. Got it. So we have the first question coming up uh, for the quiz. World Retinoblastoma Awareness Week is observed in or from first week of May, March 10th, second Sunday of May, October 7th, 17th. You can answer one, that's the question number, followed by the answer key, whichever you think is correct. That's the first question. Thank you. What? Okay, good. I just wanted to know when when to start. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening, all. Thank you, Santosh, for inviting me to speak, and uh, thank you, Carol, for hosting, and thank you, All India, for putting setting this up. Um, let me share my screen. And can everyone see my slides? Mm -hmm. Very good. So today, uh, just briefly, I want to touch on a, a, a deep subject, uh, how to predict, prevent, and treat radiation retinopathy. As you know, I'm from New York. Uh, what is radiation retinopathy? Well, it is a progressive occlusive vasculopathy that was uh, described by Archer and Gardner. Uh, many years ago. It's characterized by vascular endothelial and parasite uh, cell loss. Uh, it's, it starts a treatment, though it may not be visible uh, at the time of treatment, but the clock starts ticking once we treat patients with a certain uh, level of radiation that will later become uh, clinically evident. It is dose dependent. Uh, there is a subthreshold disease where we may never see the changes unless we look at them very closely, possibly with OCT or other forms of imaging. Uh, there's super threshold treatment that becomes clinically evident with uh, resultant severe vision loss, particularly in posterior cases. And uh, the severity is predictable. It's based on dose, dose rate, and dose to normal ocular structures that can be calculated. Uh, this is the uh, vasculopathy pathogenesis. <clears throat> As I said, we start with vascular cell loss, which leads to vascular permeability. Uh, the primary sign is edema. 
but also you can see shunting of vessels and neovascularization that contributes to edema. And the loss of vision is at first related to edema, but later to an occlusive vasculopathy. Uh, this is what we commonly see. You know, this is a choroidal melanoma, status post plaque. We see cotton wool spots. We see he intraretinal hemorrhages. Uh, we may see edema. Uh, and this is relatively early in the phase of uh, the evolution of the disease. Um, we did a study showing that uh, posterior tumors were more likely to develop radiation maculopathy. And as you see that as you go farther posterior, uh, the dose to the macula increases, and that is the primary risk factor. The, also th the other thing you see by looking at this graph is that it increases generally over the first uh, five years, and then it starts to level off. This, this is an interesting uh, graph that was recently created. And this shows that different forms of radiation will deliver different amounts of radiation to different structures. For example, on the left of the tape of the graph, you see that there's a great difference between the amount of radiation given to the sclera and therefore the subjacent choroid and retina when you compare ruthenium versus palladium, or you could easily just swap out iodine-125 as well in treatment of tumors that are five or seven millimeters tall. The dose to a seven millimeter tall tumor using ruthenium can reach as high as 1800 gray. And that is why we often see clinically for those of us who use ruthenium, uh, chorioretinal atrophy uh, in the targeted zone after treatment of taller tumors. When you get towards the apex of this of the graph, you see that it's normative because they all come together because they're given, in this case, the same apical dose. Uh, in, in, a, in some studies that we performed, we found that in general, and this is patient specific, but in general, if patients receive less than 15 gray to their macula, I'm sorry, they're less likely to develop radiation retinopathy. That would be the subthreshold group. Uh, when you give between 15 and 25 gray, you have a small risk. 25 to 50 gray, moderate risk. And almost everyone who receives over 50 gray to the fovea, it will, receive, will develop radiation retinopathy. Therefore, we use that group as a high risk group when we recently published our comparison of early treatment of radiation retinopathy versus uh, historical controls of untreated patients. That, that appeared in ophthalmology retina in January. So how do you prevent loss of vision or loss of eye uh, due to radiation vasculopathy? Well, we all know that uveal melanoma and ischemic retina produce VEGF. Uh, we accept that radiation retinopathy starts at the time of plaque therapy. So if we stratify the patients to risk, we know which patients we need to treat. In my experience, early, frequent, and persistent suppressive anti-VEGF therapy will preserve vision. What I mean by frequent is typically every four to six weeks for most patients, but that's not enough. We'll go into that in more detail in a minute. Persistent treatment will also suppress iris neovascularization and thus secondary glaucoma. So, we all, most of us who treat uh, choroidal melanomas know that anti-VEGF therapy will restore macular anatomy. Uh, it'll decrease retinal edema. Uh, it will cause resolution of retinal hemorrhages or cotton wool spots if they're allowed to form in the first place. They'll suppress neovascularization and they'll preserve visual acuity. It, I believe it will del also delay capillary dropout. This is a couple of clinical cases of before on the top and eight months after periodic intravitreal anti-VEGF therapy. You'll see that the cotton wool spots and hemorrhage have largely disappeared. And, can, they, and I believe they can be used as a method to see whether or not your treatment is working. You should expect over time 
that the hemorrhages and the cotton wool spots disappear with periodic suppression. Here's another example of macular edema before anti-VEGF therapy at 2050, and one year later, a patient has regressed macular edema and 2020 vision. Uh, here's a subfoveal tumor uh, treated with uh, anti- Total melanoma, lymphoma, VHL, retinoblastoma. Three hit television shows which featured which of these tumors? Coroidal melanoma, lymphoma, VHL, or retinoblastoma? You can send in your answers now. Perus. Okay. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Dr. Farooz Manjan Davida from Bangalore, India, and uh, she will be speaking on protocol based management of sebaceous carcinoma. Farooz? Share screen. Yes. Okay. Is it seen? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yeah, that's it. Hi, Dr. Carol. And uh, hi to everyone. Namaste. Respected mentors, colleagues, friends, and all viewers. Uh, thank you for joining us. I would like to start this presentation today with this image that speaks thousands of words uh, during this phase of COVID. And I'm extremely happy to see everyone from all across the world uh, safe and healthy. Once again, hi to all. So going on to the uh, uh, topic for today is protocol-based management of islet sebaceous gland carcinoma. I have no financial disclosures or interest. So why did we choose islet uh, sebaceous gland carcinoma today uh, to discuss uh, regarding the protocol-based management? We all know that it's a malignant islet tumor. It is a lethal islet tumor. It can masquerade and it is common in Asian countries. So it holds very much importance to uh, discuss the protocol-based management of sebaceous gland carcinoma today. So going on to the few characteristic clinical features uh, before going on to the management that we need to be looking into in order to identify this lethal islet tumor is that it occurs in older age group. It arises from the meibomian glands of the tarsus. It's usually nodular, as you can see here in this uh, photograph, firm to hard mass, yellowish in color. There will be characteristic uh, loss of eye lashes and rounding of the lid margin. Intrinsic vascularity has to be looked for with feeder vessels, as you can see in this particular image over here, characteristic dilated feeder vessels, and they can be associated conjunctival congestion. But it's not the same always. Sebaceous gland carcinoma of the eyelid is considered to be a great masquerader. It can present as a cyst, it can present as a cutaneous horn, it can present as a small lump in the margin of the eyelid or even a blepharoconjunctivitis. So uh, what are the important things that you need to know and why sebaceous gland carcinoma is important is that it has a high recurrence rate if it's not treated properly. And mostly the recurrence is due to suboptimal surgical excision. Apart from this, the other things that is alarming is the regional lymph node metastasis reported to be as high as 30%. Systemic metastasis ranging from 8 to 65% from various publications and the tumor-related or the disease-related mortality can be as high as 26%. So this is quite alarming regarding this lethal malignant islet tumor. So this was the first publication uh, way back in the early 80s by Dr. Rao who actually published the prognostic factors related to sebaceous gland carcinoma. As you can see here, there are eight of them. It depends upon the duration of symptoms, the tumor diameter that we always talk about, and also including infiltrative pattern, multicentric origin, and histopathologically being poorly differentiated. The paper also spoke about certain features which 
led to poor prognostic factor as far as mortality is concerned when the size is more than 20 millimeters involving both upper lid and lower lid and also with orbital extension. But it's very, very important to have a universal guideline and a staging system in such malignant lethal eyelid lesion. Yes, we do have the AJCC TNM classification, the eighth edition, which has been modified. And this is how we prognosticate these tumors and also decide the management. So it's not too difficult. It's basically depending upon the size of the tumor and also the involvement, whether it is invading the tarsal plate or the eyelid margin and involving the full thickness of the eyelid. So anything which is less than 10 millimeters is T1, 10 to 20 millimeters is T2, and T3 is anything which is between 20 and 30 millimeters. That means it can cover the entire eyelid, as you can see in this image over here. Further subclassified as A, B, and C, as I told you before, depending upon the invasion of tarsal plate, if it is involved, it is B, no invasion is A. And if it is a full thickness involvement of the eyelid, then it comes to C. T4 is any tumor that invades the ocular, the intraocular or facial structures. Now T4A are those with involves the ocular or intraocular and T4B are those which spreads to the edges and structures involving the paranasal sinus, nasal lacrimal system, or the brain. And it is very, very important to know this TNM classification in order to treat sebaceous gland carcinoma. Nodal positivity can be there and metastasis has to be ruled out. So this is a very valuable publication that I came across, which has been recently published in Lancet Oncology from the United States of America, which involves a lot of practitioners involving dermatologists, pathologists, ocular oncologists, including Dr. Hakan and Dr. Carol Shields is also part of this, and uh, uh, various other uh, specialists in oncology, radiation oncology, and medical oncology. So they have come across with this prognostic factors, which says it can be a bad tumor. Clinical feature, according to the staging, T2C and above with nodal positivity, histopathological whenever there is poorly differentiate, poor differentiation, perineural invasion, and there are certain immunohistochemistry markers which has been identified that correlates to poor prognostic factors like high antigen receptor expression, PD-1 expression, et cetera. So what is basically the principles in the treatment of sebaceous gland carcinoma? It is same as any oncology principle. It's mainly surgical excision of the tumor, which is the primary goal in order to prevent recurrence and improve, uh, 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 improve the uh, uh, mortality uh, rate. Ancillary investigation does play a, a, a major role in the investigation part of sebaceous gland carcinoma as well, including computerized tomography, PET scan, and sentinel lymph node biopsy, which we will be talking in subsequent slides. So the indication of computerized tomography scan uh, as a protocol includes suspected orbital or paranasal sinus and lacrimal system involvement clinically that is suspecting T2C or higher with clinically un undetected lymph node where you want to actually image the neck as well. And of course, with a positive lymph node. Any tumor that involves the caruncle, it's not only the eyelid that the sebaceous gland carcinoma can arise from, it can also arise from the caruncle. So any tumor arising from the caruncle also mandates an imaging because they can be orbital extension. Indication of PET scan includes, again, any tumor which is T2C or higher with a positive lymph node and a suspected systemic metastasis. Protocols in the management per se, as I told you, it's a complete extirpation of the tumor, making sure that the margins are clear with frozen section or most micrographic surgery, pathological confirmation of diagnosis with fixed section, including the margin positivity and negativity, and adjuvant treatment that includes in the management of sebaceous gland carcinoma are cryotherapy, mitomycin C, and radiotherapy. We'll come to that later. 
and in advanced disease, we do have indication for radiotherapy and systemic chemotherapy. So this is exactly how we go ahead with primary excision biopsy. And from various literature, it has been seen that a margin of four millimeters up to six millimeters is included. And in our clinical practice, we include four millimeter margin on either side of the clinically clear margin of the tumor uh, in the anterior lamella, as well as the posterior lamella, as you can see here in the image. The frozen section technique is our uh, favorite technique. We do not uh, do most micrographic surgery uh, quite uh, usually in our practice. Uh, so immediately the tumor after excision is sent to the pathologist and then we wait for the results from the pathologist to confirm whether the margins are negative or positive before we go ahead with the reconstruction of the eyelid. If it's a large lesion and considered to be diffuse, where clinically you are not sure about the margins, we do take extra margins and then send it separately to the pathologist. And why do we consider margin control very important in sebaceous gland carcinoma? We did evaluate and assess a series of 107 cases in way back in 2014. And we found that without frozen section, the uh, Recurrence rate was 38% when compared to 13% with frozen sections. So it really holds uh, a lot of uh, validity in doing frozen section margin control with uh, a sebaceous gland carcinoma. So this is a case of T1B with N0 and M0. The tumor is not too large. So what was done here was again, a margin clearance of four millimeters with uh, upper lid uh, reconstruction. And she's doing fine at three years post-surgical excision without recurrence. Similar case, this was a case of recurrence of tumor with a history of incision and curatage for a chalazion three times and an excision biopsy once and the tumor uh, recurring again. And this is where you can actually see uh, in the middle of the tumor, where uh, the excision biopsy has been done earlier and then she recurred, which requires extensive excision and reconstruction. So this is the case post-operatively after a cutler beard uh, reconstruction of a large lower lid sebaceous gland carcinoma. The most important thing which can go unnoticed as far as sebaceous gland carcinoma can be and which I really want to uh, uh, press upon in this uh, presentation is such subtle presentation as in this patient where she had chronic blepharoconjunctivitis involving the angle, the lateral canthus, part of the lower lid and the upper lid. And this has not been uh, 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 responding to any of topical medication where initially she was diagnosed as a case of blepharoconjunctivitis, although it is very asymmetric to have a blepharoconjunctivitis in one eye and the other eye being normal. So there was a high suspicion of pegetoid spread of sebaceous gland carcinoma in this case clinically, and uh, it came out to be an intraepithelial invasion or pegetoid variant. So in this particular situation, we actually take the protocols in a slightly different way so the first step when you suspect a pegetoid variant in sebaceous gland carcinoma would be MAP biopsy. So we do take a two into two millimeter uh, uh, tissue biopsies from various parts of the ocular surface, including the bulba conjunctiva, the fornix, including the upper, the lower, and the tarsal conjunctiva, and most often the carincula. So we come to around seven, 16 to 17 specimen from an eyeball in order to rule out a vegetoid spread in sebaceous gland carcinoma. And this is how we go about. So how do we decide whether we have to do a MAP biopsy in a case of sebaceous gland carcinoma? Well, of course, in a case where the nodule is very well defined, we may not uh, recommend a, a MAP biopsy in such a case, but when there is a tumor in a eyelid, whether it's upper lid or lower lid, associated with diffuse congestion in and around the tumor and at a distant place, other than the tumor involving the fornix or the bulba conjunctiva, MAP biopsy is mandated. How do you treat a pegetoid variant of sebaceous gland carcinoma? Of course, with surgical excision, 
posterior lamella excision has been uh, uh, extensively done and there has been uh, excellent work from the Shields group on posterior lamella excision in such situation. And if you have a recurrence or a positive margin in a pudgetoid spread, cryotherapy and mitomycin C can also be considered. Cryotherapy for conjunctival uh, SGC, but not for eyelid invasive SGC. Now, going on to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, when is it indicated? So neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we propose systemic chemotherapy uh, uh, that is usually used in head and neck tumors uh, by head and neck oncologist. 5-fluorouracil, paclitaxel, and cisplatin is given three to six cycles. And the main aim of uh, giving a neoadjuvant chemotherapy in such extensive disease is basically to chemo reduce, chemo reduction, reducing the size of the tumor as much it can be surgically amenable for complete excision with a clear margin. And that's why we use neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Sometimes stereotactic radiotherapy is also added along with systemic chemotherapy and uh, excision biopsy. Uh, in sebaceous gland carcinoma. Well, of course, if systemic metastasis is proven, systemic chemotherapy is also indicated. Stereotactic radiotherapy, uh, monotherapy with radiation, well, uh, the indications are not really laid down uh, accurately. There are uh, certain uh, case reports who have uh, used radiotherapy in cases which is not surgically amenable and you had to treat the tumor. Well, we do use stereotactic radiotherapy uh, in, ca in case of orbital, uh, uh, a sebaceous gland carcinoma extending into the orbital, orbit or paranasal sinus with perineural invasion, bony invasion, even after excentration, if it is proven that the bone is invaded, a radiotherapy is indicated. And of course, in the presence of uh, neck lymph node uh, involvement, uh, radiotherapy to the neck is also indicated. Now, going on to a destructive surgical procedure like excentration, we do not uh, uh, prefer too often. Uh, we al always prefer to uh, uh, salvage the eye as much as possible. But well, there are situations where there is extensive orbital extension. And in this case, the patient has recurrent sebaceous gland carcinoma involving the upper lid. As you can see here, there is a large lump in the lower lid, although the proptosis is not that uh, evident here with very minimal orbital extension and a diffuse intraepithelial spread. So these are the indications when we would consider excentration in sebaceous gland carcinoma. Indication of sentinel lymph node biopsy, yes, it has been addressed in, there has been uh, more than 100 cases where sentinel lymph node biopsy has been done from various reports. Uh, so the indication of sentinel lymph node biopsy in sebaceous gland carcinoma is any tumor more than 10 millimeters in the greatest horizontal diameter and 10 uh, T2C or higher. So uh, before I come uh, to the end of my uh, presentation here, one thing that I really, really want to address here is in any doubtful situation of sebaceous gland carcinoma, a histopathological evaluation is a must. So this was a case of recurrent uh, chalazion uh, in a 67-year-old in a lady where, of course, there is kind of a suspicion of a sebaceous gland carcinoma arising from the tarsus. So whenever you do an incision curatage repeatedly in such situation, the specimen has to be sent for histopathological evaluation. And in certain situation, when there is suspicion, you do a biopsy and it comes as indeterminate, repeat the biopsy again. And certain studies have considered immunohistochemistry uh, uh, factors like androgen receptor positivity, nuclear factor 13A, adipophilin, and perilipin also confirming the diagnosis. So uh, basically, uh, coming to the end of the presentation, protocol-based management in sebaceous gland carcinoma is very, very important. And we consider primary wide surgical excision as a gold standard. Surgical pro protocols has to be obeyed because this reduces the recurrence and improves uh, the life uh, span of the patient. Uh, Neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy does have uh, 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 a place in the management of sebaceous gland carcinoma, but indicated. 
And uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your patient listening. And um, I can take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Farouz. That was a wonderful talk on a challenging subject. And I know you have immense experience in India, far more than we have in the US uh, with sebaceous carcinoma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Thank you so much. Can you stop sharing the screen, Farouz? Yes. So we have one more quiz question coming up. This is the third question. You see this particular lesion on the eyelid of this child. He's an infant, of course. What is this associated with? Face syndrome, lumbar syndrome, none of the above, both the above. You can send your response as question three and your choice of the key, A, B, C, or D, to the WhatsApp number that's given. Thank you. The screen is not shared, Dr. Santosh. It's not shared? Oh, no, no. We are seeing you as A, B, C, and D. Okay. <laughs> Let me just. Okay. Is it seen now? Yes, we can see it. Yes. All right. Question three. This lesion, upper eyelid lesion in the left eye in this infant is most likely associated with face syndrome, lumbar syndrome, none of the above, both the above. You can send your answer as question number three and followed by the key A, B, C, or D of your choice. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that stimulating question. Um, our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Carol Karp. She's speaking to us from Miami, Florida, uh, from Bascom Palmer. And she will speak on the subject of which she is an amazing international expert, uh, topical therapy for ocular surface squamous neoplasia. Thank you, Dr. Karp. Thank you so much. And Hello to all my friends. Thank you, Dr. Hanavar, for the invitation. And it's wonderful to be here with all of you. So I am a, a cornea specialist and have developed a, a wonderful practice of ocular surface uh, neoplasia. And today I'm going to share with you the most common tumor that we have, which is um, squamous carcinoma of the conjunctiva. Rajesh will do a campaign. I have no financial interest to disclose, but I will be discussing off label use <laughs> of patients. And I want to thank my fellow Sarah Wall and Despina Theodica, and all of my friends. And thank you. I hear, a, I hear some noise in the background. Could the faculty turn off their microphones? Please mute your microphones. So um, ocular surface squamous neoplasia or OSSN is a spectrum of disease which goes from mild neoplasia to intraepithelial disease, in situ disease, and then invasive squamous cell carcinoma. And as I said, it is the most common uh, ocular surface tumor that I see and that we see. And it has many features which are gelatinous, papillary, and opalescent. And the risk factors, number one is light um, but immunosuppression, human papilloma virus are also cofactors. And the question really is, do we do chemo or do we cut? So Dr. Hanovar is gonna talk about the cut. And today I'm talking to you about topical chemotherapy of which I'm a great fan. The main ones we'll be talking about are mitomycin, 5-FU and interferon, but there are other options too. I've used, uh, retinoic acid and a new publication is now out by Dr. Ib uh, using a combination of interferon and uh, retinoic acid, I've used sodafovir, but the main ones we'll talk about are the top three. So when I see a tumor in my clinic, um, of course I see here, I look for the papillary features, some leukoplakia, fimbriated vessels, feeder vessels, and we take pictures, but I like to have in my mind an image of the tumor and it helps me remember it. 
So when I look here, this to me looks a little bit like a hot dog and a bun and a skewer. So I see here a little hot dog on a bun, which is not very good for me because I don't eat beef. But as an ocular oncologist, I really don't like it because this is a neoplastic lesion. I'm a big fan of something called high resolution OCT and every patient of mine gets scanned and it really helps me confirm a diagnosis and it also helps me while I treat the patient to make sure the lesion goes away completely. What you see here is a high resolution OCT of that hot dog lesion. You see here thickened hyperreflective epithelium and an abrupt transition from normal. And these are the classic features that you see with OSSN on high resolution OCT. So what is this lesion then? Could be that it's a skewered hot dog. Uh, it's an ocular surface squamous neoplasia. So I decided to treat him uh, topically. I used 5 fluorouracil 1% eye drops. I use it four times a day for one week. I give them three weeks off and I repeat the cycles. In general, it's four cycles that I need to do to cure the majority of the tumors. So here's the patient, the 5-FU topically, and this was with four cycles. And this is how the patient looked after four one-week cycles. It worked like magic. So surgery, we'll hear about from Dr. Hanovar. It definitely works. It is diagnostic and therapeutic and is the gold standard but we can't guarantee that we get free margins all the time. And I'm not gonna go through the technique because Dr. Hanavar is gonna talk about this, uh, but it is the gold standard. And the problem is, is that with positive margins, you have a high risk for recurrence. And even with negative margins, you can have a significant rate of recurrence. And the problem is, is that we don't see, we guess says, okay, well, here's the tumor, let's take four millimeters, we do a no-touch technique, dry, but we can't guarantee that we're gonna get everything out. And cryotherapy, of course, with alcohol. And sometimes they don't heal as pretty as we like, or my main concern, especially as a cornea specialist, is that we kill all the stem cells, and then these patients end up with stem cell deficiency and need a slit. So the rationale for medical therapy is that it allows me to treat the entire ocular surface, is uh, then treating subclinical disease and microscopic disease. And it avoids the extensive surgeries that can cause complications. When I face with a tumor that's big, some of people say to me, oh, I don't want to treat it with medicine because it's too big. I think that's the perfect patient to start on medical therapy because most of the time you're going to cure it and if not, you will chemo reduce it. So what are my options? I have nicknames for all my, my drops so that my patients remember them. And so my three main doors of options are mitomycin, which is my devil drop, or as in Miami, we say Gota del Diablo. 5-FU, which is my little devil, which is Diablito. And my angel drop is interferon because it's so well tolerated. So for mitomycin, we're very familiar with this in ophthalmology. I use 0.04%. I use it four times a day for a week. And then I do one or two weeks off until the eye is white and quiet. I think it's very important to wait for the eye to be completely healed with no epitheliopathy, because if you've broken down the epithelium on the cornea, that's really when you're going to have more of the toxicity from mitomycin. I do use a plug, steroids, artificial tears. And in the US, it's very expensive. I know in India, it's much more of a bargain, but we charge $400 a bottle and it is compounded, of course. And it does work uh, well, but the toxicity is what I don't like. And here's a patient uh, who was treated with mitomycin. And after two cycles, you'll see that there's a nice uh, resolution. OCT helps me because I can watch the tumor go away and I can pick up subclinical disease. And we recently published our series where when I thought it was gone and I did my OCT, about 17% of the patients still had a little bit of subclinical disease, which means we wanna do a little bit more than when you think it's completely gone. And so here on the OCT, remember 
thickened hyperreflective epithelium. That's what we see here. I treated this patient with mitomycin. And then you see dark, thin, normalized epithelium. The complications of mitomycin are not kind. It causes epitheliopathy, punctal stomonosis, and stem cell deficiency. 5-FU is now my favorite way of treating this because it works and because it's very low cost. It is uh, $50, between $38 and $50 um, for a psycho. And I use it one week on, three weeks off, as we showed in the patient with the hot dog. And in general, it's about four cycles, but it can be six or eight, or sometimes it goes away in two, but I always do four. We've published on this showing that it's very efficacious and it's also equal and comparable to treatment with interferon. So here's a patient with a nice, big, juicy, cauliflower on his eye and OSSN. And I treated this with my four cycles of 5-FU, 1%, remember one week at a time, with a nice a resolution, which is very easy and very inexpensive. And it's magic. Complications are really not as bad as, my, as mitomycin. Some patients get a little bit of a red eye. Mostly it's more at the lid and I have them use some Vaseline um, to the lower eyelid skin to prevent any excoriation and steroid and tears as necessary. Interferons were my favorite way of treating. I think Carol may remember, she calls me the interferon lady a long time ago. And I really loved interferons um, because this is immunotherapy. It's produced by our white cells and it has both um, antineoplastic and uh, antiviral properties. And it's used in the, uh, in the body for other viral based um, and uh, neoplastic tumors. Uh, I use it both as an eye drop, which is 1 million international units per ml QID. And this is a drop that you give every day. Um, it's well tolerated and everyday use is just fine. Remember the other two are cycled. And I also give subconjunctival injections. I do 3 million international units um, and a half a cc. I do this now once a week. Originally, when I started my protocols, it was three times a week because that's what was done for hepatitis when I sort of made this up. Um, I do it once a week now. It's much easier for the patients. And um, I'm little Carol. Carol Shields, you're big Carol. I give three million. She gives 10 million once a month. So I do one million once a week and others do 10 million uh, once a month. Now, I love it because it's gentle but it has been become crazy expensive in the United States and difficult to obtain. So we charge now $800 a month for topical interferon. And I know in India, you guys have it for a dollar. I mean, it's very inexpensive and it's, it's amazing that you can have access to that that is so inexpensive. But in the States, it's become crazy. So here's a patient that failed 5-FU. I tried the inexpensive way, but it did not respond. And you see here this gelatinous lesion for her. And so she took the interferon. We have to pay out of pocket here, the patients. And after two months, this was a nice, beautiful response to topical interferon. And I always do four months. And what I wanna mention about our study is that if you don't have the OCT to confirm that the entire surface is completely normalized, and when you see it gone, you need to do another six to eight weeks of interferon or another two cycles of 5-FU just to ensure that you're eradicating all subclinical disease. And we found that once you did this extra cycles, two months, six weeks, then our recurrence rate was zero. So here we go, this patient here with the gelatinous lesion, you see the thickened hyperreflective epithelium and after interferon, then you see this nice, thin, normalized, dark epithelium. The corneal lesions are a little more challenging. First of all, they're often misdiagnosed. So someone may say it's a panis, they may call it a Salzman's, they may call it mapped out fingerprint dystrophy, depends what it looks like. And the problem for surgical removal is that the limbus may look normal. And we know that it originates from the limbus and then you're doing a guess, you're killing and sacrificing cells that may have tumor or may not have tumor. So I love topical therapy for these corneal lesions. 
And here's a patient that I treated topically with interferon for five months. So in summary, mitomycin, I use 0.4 for a week on and a week and then two weeks, so three weeks off and a punctal plug. I call it my gota del diablo because of the epitheliopathy pain and stem cell deficiency. I love interferon um, and I used it for many, many years since the early 90s. I use it four times a day, every day or inject it three million. Uh, the problem is it's just become very expensive in the United States that is prohibitive for many patients. Um, the injections do give a flu-like syndrome, so you need to use um, acetaminophen and, and warn them about that. And now 5-AQ is my favorite because it's easy. It's one week on, three mm. weeks off. It's an easy cycling. It's well tolerated, and it's a real bargain. So that's my cota del diablito. And remember the number four, four months of a minimum of interferon, four cycles, et cetera. So chemo or cut. Um, so if, well, if you have a patient that there's a doubtful diagnosis, you need to cut. If you have a patient who's got willing to put in their eye drops like this little cat, great. If they're not gonna be compliant, they need surgery. And is one better? Really, we found that they're both excellent options. So I think you need to judge it based on the tumor. Recurrent lesions, annular lesions, diffuse lesions are best treated medically. Um, and if a patient doesn't want surgery, then topical uh, treatment is excellent. And I treat the vast majority of my primary lesions uh, with a topical medication. The other thing I love to talk about is high resolution OCT. I make this little joke here that I feel like I'm operating. Now I have an N95 on my, my face, but this is just a regular mask, but I have a blindfold. That's what I feel like because I can't see the edges of where my tumor is. And the OCT really helps me. And this was first a custom device built by my colleague, Jay Wang. And now I use commercially available devices that really help me see. So back to our patient with the hot dog, here's his conjunctival tumor. We see the thickened hyperreflective epithelium. Remember I treated him with 5-FU and you see that now he has thin normalized uh, epithelium. So I know that I'm done. So in summary then, a surgery, which we'll hear about in a few moments with Dr. Hanavar, is very successful, but when they're large tumors, annular recurrent, um, you can get complications. Topical medications are especially helpful in those scenarios and corneal, but also the vast majority of primary tumors will go away with topical medications. And if they don't, you see them back in six weeks or eight weeks, then you can change your plan and take it off. Please try 5-FU if you have not. And new imaging techniques are incredibly helpful for us to help to diagnose the tumor before intervention, guide biopsy, and also ensure that we've had complete eradication before terminating a medication. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Karp. You have immense experience with all these topical agents. You make it so simple for all of us. And yes, you have convinced us that interferon is great, but maybe the most rational would be to use 5-FU. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you... Uh, Turn off the screen sharing, please. Oh, I think I thought I did. All right. It's yeah, it's off. All right. We uh, go to the fourth question. What is Zimmerman's tumor? Is it phacomatous choristoma, VPRT, or vasoproliferative rectal tumor, ciliary body melanoma, or ciliary body adenoma? Answer your question on WhatsApp with question number four and the key of your choice. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker will be our coordinator of this All India Ophthalmology Symposium on Ocular Oncology, Dr. Santosh Hanavar, and he will speak on surgical management 
of ocular surface squamous neoplasia, a very important topic given the commonality of this tumor. Thank you, Dr. Shields. I'll be talking on uh, surgical management of ocular surface squamous neoplasia. What do we do currently? Dr. Kaaf has very beautifully elucidated the role of topical immunotherapy and chemotherapy, which is very real. However, there are very specific indications for surgery. A patient with invasive squamous cell carcinoma, or despite all the imaging modalities that you have at your command, if you have no definite conclusion about the invasion or the depth of the lesion. If the, has, if the tumor has gone beyond the epithelium into the stroma, obviously there is no role for topical therapy. If the tumor is localized and nodular elevated, then chemotherapy may work, but not as beautifully as it does in diffuse placard tumors. In patients who are intolerant to topical chemotherapy or those where you suspect the patient may have poor compliance, for example, this patient was started by somebody else on topical therapy. You see here already that this is an invasive tumor. You can see that the posterior lamina of the eyelid is involved. The sclera is involved here. And promptly the patient has gone worse over a period of three weeks. So this is definitely not a candidate for topical therapy. Of a tumor of this sort, which is a mucoepidermoid ocular surface squamous neoplasia with a very small breakthrough, but it is highly elevated and nodular. This is unlikely to resolve with topical therapy. But when we go to surgery, if you look at the literature, some of the review articles show that the rate of local tumor recurrence is as high as 33% which is simply not good because we are looking at a malignant tumor where we expect nearly 100% local tumor control, which is actually possible. Local tumor recurrence is mainly because of microscopic residual tumor at the edge or the base of the tumor or because of systemic predisposition that the patient may have, such as xeroderma pigmentosum or immunocompromised status. It is also now known that recurrence of a tumor is the strongest factor predisposing to loss of vision, loss of eye and metastasis. So we have to prevent local tumor recurrence. And if we have to do that, then we have to fall back on renowned oncological principles, which are whenever you operate on a malignant tumor, we are supposed to have edge clearance. And if the tumor is very extensive, we can reduce its size preoperatively by new adjuvant topical therapy. We're also supposed to have base clearance. And then based on histopathology, we are supposed to provide adjuvant treatment to minimize the chance of local tumor recurrence if the patient has any risk factors. And in patients who are predisposed to local tumor recurrence, such as those who have syndromic associations such as xeroderma or HIV zero positivity, then you do local immunomodulation to minimize the risk of local tumor recurrence. Let's look at each of these. How do we assess the extent of the tumor or the edge? Slit lamp is a great idea. Meticulous slit lamp evaluation actually tells you where the tumor ends and where normal conjunctiva begins. But there is always a small zone of transition which you can identify by the varied architecture or thickening of the conjunctiva, for example, on slit lamp and also anterior segment OCT. But if you really have a doubt as to where the affected conjunctiva ends and where the normal conjunctiva begins, then you can st stain with rose bengal. Rose bengal stain is taken up by subclinical part of the tumor. Even subtle epithelial affection of the corneal epithelial affection of the tumor is stained with rose bengal. So it demarcates the tumor quite vividly, thus making the job quite easier. So your differentiation of the edge of the tumor is better with rose bengal stain. And what if a tumor is very extensive? This particular tumor is so large. Of course, you can do surgery. But if you can reduce the tumor by using newer adjuvant chemotherapy or new adjuvant immunotherapy, this larger tumor has now been restricted to a smaller residual. That's because this is the tumor epicenter 
where most likely invasive squamous cell carcinoma is supposed to be that is surrounded by a zone of carcinoma in situ severe moderate and mild dysplasia all of which goes away with topical therapy and what you finally have is a small residual tumor to excise so if you have a very large or a diffuse tumor and finally if surgery may be required despite which you can try topical therapy to reduce the extent of final surgical intervention hs are relatively easy but what about the base one way of assessing the base is to move the tumor on top of sclera by moving it with a wet cotton tip applicator but if a patient has a epistleral adhesion of a tumor like this the tumor is adherent to the epistera they have no way to know whether the tumor has involved the sclera or not or how deep into the sclera is it then you fall back on imaging oct and tumor are very uh, methods to image the depth of the tumor in this you see clearly that the tumor is involving the only the conjunctiva tenens in fact this bubbly layer is tenens is free epistera is free so your plane of dissection can just be subtenens so you preoperatively know the depth of the tumor if you do anterior segment imaging this is a patient where there is predominantly corneal ocular surface squamous neoplasia we don't know how deep into the cornea is it would we be able to excise it completely or not you do ubm and you clearly see here that this particular part of the corneal stroma is thickened as opposed to normal stroma there so corneal stroma is full thickness involved here either this patient would need a penetrating keratoplasty or you have to resort to plaque vacature in patients who have extensive tumor where you cannot do gonioscopy or when you cannot see through the tumor to see if the angle is involved then again anterior segment imaging is very useful to know if the patient already has iris anterior chamber angle or ciliary body extension in such patients enucleation or extended enucleation is a choice or plaque vacature good news about imaging is that it actually correlates with what we see on histopathology you see the oct here is very very closely mimicking the final histopathology that we have so imaging is very useful in predicting the depth of the tumor what is bad about imaging is that if there is lot of keratin then there is shadowing so that precludes assessment of the depth of the tumor if a tumor has lot of keratin then you may not be able to reliably assess the depth of the tumor so you still be it will be a judgment call on the table as you operate when we talk about surgery we talk about excision with tumor free margins alcohol assisted keratoepithelial epitheliectomy cryotherapy to the resection edge cryotherapy to the resection base is optional but this is mandatory excision with 4 mm tumor free margins alcohol assisted keratoepithelectomy for the corneal epithelial component of the tumor resection edge cryotherapy with a 3 mm cryoprobe will give you an additional 3 to 4 mm margin clearance for subclinical part of the tumor which you may not be able to pick up on slit lamp may not be able to assess on imaging may not even be able to stain cryotherapy to resection base is limited to patients where there is one or two clock hour of tumor adhesion slightly deeper into the cornea or onto the sclera where you think that there might be microscopic residual despite doing a lamellar surgery there lamellar keratectomy is reserved for patients who have tumor which has gone beyond the bowman's membrane bowman's is a very good barrier to the tumor to go into the stroma so you don't want to disturb bowman's but the tumor has already gone into the stroma and it's superficial then you can do lamellar sclerectomy lamellar keratectomy and similarly for superficial invasion into the sclera you do lamellar sclerectomy this is a video clip that shows uh, the way we do excision of ocular surface squamous neoplasia after having localized its extent we mark the edge of excision with a uh, bipolar radio frequency electrode and excise either using a monopolar rf electrode or scissors is perfect the edge is being excised at this point in time then the edge is held the unaffected edge is held with a forceps and the tumor is dissected of the epistera under visualization as you approach the limbus 
the blood vessels which feed the tumor have to be cauterized then you dry the cornea and apply absolute alcohol to the leading edge of the tumor about 3 to 4 mm beyond the visible edge of the tumor to denature the corneal epithelium and also make it loose so that you can simply scroll it off the performance membrane then you reach the limbus from the corneal epithelial side we have already reached the limbus from the conjunctival side so finally we have to do what is called superficial limbectomy or excise the tumor of the limbus one edge to the other so that is uh, the excision at the limbus under visualization completely a controlled procedure where you see exactly what you are doing that's resection edge cryotherapy a 3 mm cryoprobe going under the excised edge of the conjunctiva freezing the excised edge and you spontaneously allow it to thaw it and do it twice over that's double freeze thaw cryotherapy all along the excision margin excision based cryotherapy in this patient we are doing because there was an area where there was slightly deeper penetration of the tumor we are not sure until we get his pathology but up front we can opt to do this if the area which is suspicious is about 1 to 2 clock hours not more than 3 clock hours of limbal cryotherapy is advisable for the fear of limbal stem cell deficiency when we are done with it you have to repair the ocular surface either by using a conjunctival autograph or simply glue gluing on an amniotic membrane that's the pc glue that we are using and the amniotic membrane is glued on to the defective area of the uh, epibulbar surface and rest of the amniotic membrane is trim so this gives a patient leaves the patient quite asymptomatic because we have even covered the, the epithelialized area of the cornea with amniotic membrane so surgery is an excellent option it gives good results and cosmosis as well as you see in these patients that's the tumor pre operatively and that is post operatively we get nearly good cosmetic outcome the eye doesn't look bad and the surgical results are quite um, good this is a patient where there is about 6 clock hours of limbal involvement despite which there is no limbal stem cell deficiency well it does happen if the tumor extends is more than 6 clock hours there is a higher chance of limbal stem cell deficiency so if you have an extensive tumor of this sort when you fear that there might be limbal stem cell deficiency you can do what is called a primary simple limbal epithelial transplantation where bits of limbus from the normal eye are harvested cut into much smaller bits and glued on to the cornea on top and on top of an amniotic membrane this takes care of limbal stem cell deficiency or prevents the chance of a patient having limbal stem cell deficiency this is a somewhat a newer advance another new advance is the use of ioct or intraoperative oct guided excision for a tumor for controlled excision into the stroma so once you have done surgery the next step is to lay the tumor on top of a filter paper the edges being marked and the conjunctiva nicely scrolled off made planar and sent to the pathologist what does pathologist do he tells us whether the excision edge is involved and the excision base is involved in this patient obviously there is excision edge involvement so your adjuvant therapy should be guided by histopathology you cannot leave a patient alone if the excision edge and the base are involved this is the protocol that we follow if the resection edge is positive and it is only dysplasia or carcinoma in situ if you have already done cryotherapy then you simply want to observe this patient or if you haven't done cryotherapy then topical chemotherapy is good for a patient who has only dysplasia or carcinoma in situ if the resection edge is positive and the edge has invasive squamous cell carcinoma then at least medico legally you are bound to re excise because invasive squamous cell carcinoma has poor response to topical therapy if the resection base is positive and if it's only localized say one or two clock hours then you can get away with cryotherapy if the resection base is positive and that is diffuse then the only option you have is plaque brachytherapy or re excision if a patient is prone to recurrence because of systemic factors then you do immunomodulation 
there are cases which are slightly beyond surgery, such as this patient who has nearly full thickness scleral invasion. Earlier, we would inoculate them. Currently, what we do is we excise the tumor, flush with the sclera without losing the tectonic integrity of the sclera. And for the residual tumor within the sclera, we do a secondary plaque breakage. So primarily, we excise the tumor in flush with the sclera. Then we cover the bare sclera with amniotic membrane, leave it to granulate or heal. After about four to six weeks, you do plaque breakage therapy. That's called secondary plaque breakage therapy because here we wait for the pathologist to tell us whether the base is involved. This is quite logical. If you're really not sure whether the base is involved or not, then you can resort to secondary plaque breakage therapy, wait for the pathologist to tell you or confirm that the base is involved and the location of involvement and do plaque breakage therapy. This gives very good results. All these patients were earlier managed with secondary plaque breakage therapy. Despite the extensive scleral invasion, they all look good following plaque breakage therapy. This patient has completed about five years of follow-up. You can see that his affected left eye looks nearly normal without any cosmetic deformity. And also his ocular surface looks very good without any side effects of plaque breakage therapy, not even a cataract. Cataract is not generally a complication of surface plaque breakage therapy because we only treat about two to two and a half millimeter thickness. Can you save this eye? Extensive scleral and corneal stomal involvement. Five years ago, I would have said no. Now it is possible. Excise this tumor partially in flush with sclera and in flush with the rest of the corneal stoma. Don't go deep and do lamella sclerectomy or keratectomy. And for the residual tumor, do plaque breakage therapy, and these patients do quite well. But what about these patients where surgery may not be possible at all? This patient has necrotic sclera, necrotic cornea. If you were to do surgery in this patient, you would have a large perforation in the eye, which may be very difficult to repair. In these patients, we do primary plaque breakage therapy. Primary plaque breakage therapy is when you don't do surgery, we already know that the tumor has gone into the sclera and corneal stroma. Estimate the depth by imaging. And for that particular depth, place the plaque right on top of the tumor, including a safe margin. And these patients tend to do quite well. This is one more example of a patient where primary plaque breakage therapy was done for corneal stromal involvement, where we thought that surgery would be a little dangerous for the tectonic integrity of the eye. And this patient also did well. And the success of plaque breakage therapy is about 90% in terms of eye salvage. What's new, at least for India, was that plaque was very expensive. Now we make it in India. Ruthenium is currently made in India by uh, BARC, which is a government of India organization. This is 5% of the cost of a plaque which is imported. So it has become more affordable and every ocular oncologist can get hold of this plaque and use it very simply. One more newer advancement is a plaque where ruthenium is on both the sides of what looks like a simplifron ring for simultaneous treatment of both the palpable as well as the bulba connectiva at the same time. This is also made by, this is a custom prototype currently by BRC. BRC is also coming in with a strontium medical applicator, which may be very useful for localized scleral invasion. So next up, uh, Question is, how to minimize the risk of tumor recurrence in those who are predisposed, such as HIV positive or xerotoma pigmentosum patient? In those, we do what is called immunomodulation. This is a protocol-based management. We are trying use of 1 million international units per ml of interferon alpha-2b once a day indefinitely. And these patients currently are doing well. They have a much reduced chance of local tumor recurrence if they're on interferon as compared to if they're not on interferon. So these are the kind of patients where, would want, where you would want to do topical immunomodulation. But this is the data that we had earlier, 20 to 40% reported local tumor recurrence, generally within two years. Now with the protocol that I just mentioned, we have less than 5% of local tumor recurrence. In fact, it's come down to about 2%. So in conclusion, I would say that excision with tumor-free margins and resection edge cryotherapy provides impressive tumor control in patients who have a specific indication for surgical excision beyond what you can do for them by means of topical therapy. 
of course you have to take care of oncological principles such as edge control and base control with appropriate image imaging and also histopathologically guided adjuvant therapy for much better outcomes thank you so much thank you dr hanovar for that excellent overview very interesting to see that you've been able to create a low cost plaque ruthenium and the the conformer plaque that's all very interesting i'll be sure to contact you regarding that <laughs> because we see the need for that too in the States. So um, do we have time for a question? This is question five. It's a very familiar <laughs> figure. Identify him. Is it Ponyphil, Abramson, Coates, or Shields? <laughs> okay. Handsome. Okay. Our next speaker, uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Ashwin Reddy. He will speak on a new topic on the intraarterial management of with chemotherapy for retinoblastoma, current status. Thank you, uh, Dr. Reddy. I, I know all the excellent results you, you have achieved in your department, and we're interested in hearing uh, your talk. Thank you. Um, I'm just getting my presentation on now. So thank you for the invitation to um, speak. Greetings from London. Um, um, Santosh, I've known for 15 years. When I was first appointed in London um, 15 years ago, I came and visited Santosh in Hyderabad. And as you can see, he hasn't changed very much, but I certainly have. So um, I'm talking about intra-arterial chemotherapy. And this is a disorder or for, uh, this is a treatment for retinoblastoma. And it's really indicated for intraocular disease rather than extraocular disease. So it's more for high income and middle income countries. And I know India's using more and more intra-arterial chemotherapy. So intra-arterial chemotherapy has been used in Japan for 30 odd years. And this is Dr. Suzuki from uh, Tokyo. And they used a balloon method um, up the internal carotid artery. And around 2006 to eight, it was popularized by David Abramson in New York. And the reason we use Melphalan is because of the experience in Japan. So um, I particularly like this picture of a policeman in India. So we're in the COVID era at the moment. So if we can give the treatment, the chemotherapy directly to the eye, it seems advantageous. If we can avoid systemic side effects, like um, immunosuppression, particularly in the COVID era, that's really more important because these children otherwise would be at risk of um, suffering from COVID-19. It's also useful for 13Q deletion syndrome where um, patients suffer with um, systemic side effects and there's increased globe salvage from group DIs. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that. The disadvantage is we're still using radiation and we don't know what the results from that area are. We're not 100% about this ideal dose. There's a learning curve, which Dr. Shields has um, discussed in her papers. There's a loss of this safety net for the micrometastases if we don't use systemic, side effect, so systemic chemotherapy. And of course, the side effects, which I will be talking about. So what do we do? So we have the patient under anesthetic, we catheterize the femoral artery. So we pop a, a very small catheter up the femoral artery, goes all the way up to the internal carotid artery. And we give malphalan and topotica. So here we have the internal carotid artery. 
and we have the ophthalmic artery coming off it. Sometimes the ophthalmic artery comes off the middle meningeal artery. And it's really tough for the interventional neuroradiologists. They have to put a catheter up the um, internal carotid. And e um, in our service, and I know in other services, they leave the catheter and near the ostium, but in our, our service, they're popping it into the ophthalmic artery. Um, but they're not going to, we don't inject unless we can show there's anti-grade flow around the catheter and vis a visible choroidal blush. So there's no occlusion. And there's Dr. Shields, who with um, John Hungerford, set up our um, intra-arterial chemotherapy in London at Great Ormond Street um, over a decade ago. So age appropriate doses is what we give. And I'd like just to highlight the three year old having five milligram. And we'll be talking about that when we come to complications. So we give malphalan and topotecan in age appropriate doses, give them three times every four to six weeks, sometimes every three weeks. And it's that balance. We need to treat the tumor avoid the nucleations and so forth. And I will talk about this with group D, but we also need to avoid complications that we don't get with systemic chemotherapy. And we need to avoid these metastases as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about first line group DI treatment of intraarterial chemotherapy. So if we use first line systemic chemotherapy, in our service in London, we were getting 63% salvage. That was before the era of intravitreal chemotherapy. So you can assume that may go up to about 70% possibly salvage. But with first-line intraarterial chemotherapy, studies from um, Dr. Shields, Dr. Munia, have pushed this right up to 100%, 90 to 100% for group DIs. Often, intravitreal chemotherapy is used afterwards. But the risk that we worried about, we worry about, and it's why we were a late adopter of this in the UK, was the metastasis risk of 3%. So the advantages, um, this is from um, Francis Munier's paper, uh, this is Francis here, um, is that we have less relapses if we're giving first line intraarterial chemotherapy. So, that one relapse is at intravitreal chemotherapy quite often, as opposed to three. Less EUAs, and that's got to be a good thing. So nine versus 18. And in, in his group of 25, he had 100% um, uh, salvage, which is also very good. So now I'm going to talk a bit about complications of uh, intraarterial chemotherapy. So back in 2012, we published um, some interesting complications. This is a third nerve palsy due to intra-arterial intra chemotherapy. You can see the dilated pupil and the difficulty with adduction. And Dr. Shields had, uh, all, had been publishing regarding the importance of fluorescein angiogra angiography. And Dr. Mooney and Dr. Shields had mentioned RP changes for these patients. But look at the dose, we're giving five milligrams for an 11 month old. We would never dream of doing that now because we give age appropriate doses. But you can see the choroidal ischemia and the effect of that. So we published on vision. We're very interested in vision. And we only had 12 eyes, which is, aren't, isn't a huge number of eyes. But the reason for that is we were looking for healthy foveola eyes. And there are not many of those, particularly being treated for intraarterial chemotherapy. But initially, we had five um, out of 12, 40% losing vision, severe visual loss. But look at the dose, they all had five milligrams or more of malphalan. And we, because these are infants, they are difficult to assess regarding vision. So we were using pattern reversal visual evoke potentials, plus other orthoptic measures for the assessment of vision. 
However, when we reduce the doses and we got age appropriate doses, not five milligrams in all cases, we didn't lose vision. So now we had nine patients, all with healthy foveola, and we didn't lose vision. And in fact, we didn't have, we had only one patient with the sixth nerve palsy. So we're reducing um, cranial nerve palsies as well. However, we're still getting some catheter problems with a third having difficulty with accessing the ophthalmic artery and three having severe atomic, autonomic reactions. And um, recently a paper by, from Anthony Daniels in IOVS looked at rabbits and humans for intra-arterial chemotherapy. And when he used the dose, this is the dose that he uses, 0.4 milligrams per kilogram malthalan, he didn't, wasn't getting complications. But when he doubled the dose, he was getting arterial occlusion and neutropenia. So the study shows that a rabbit model for intra-arterial chemotherapy toxicity demonstrates retinopathy and vasculopathy related to drug and dose, not procedure and approach, or approach, which we'd agree with. So the balance is between giving the a high enough dose to treat our tumours, but not giving too much so that we lose vision and we get these complications. And it's really trying to find the ideal dose to achieve that. So finally, I'd just like to um, do a look at a case and I'll be using the term IAC rescue, which was coined by Dr. Shields um, for this patient. So we have a five month old, pitched up with a right eye, which was very advanced and required a nucleation, and a group B left eye. So five tumours in that left eye. And we gave systemic chemotherapy because you can see this tumour right abutting the optic nerve. So if you lasered that whole area, you're going to go th through that nerve. You can laser part of it, but not all, the entire area. So this tumor number one was very troublesome. So we gave three injections of intra-arterial chemotherapy, and these are age-appropriate dose injections. And this was effective, this is after relapse of tumor one, for two and a half years. Then we gave another age-appropriate dose, so second cycle, three injections. So the patients had six injections at this stage, but it was only effective for four months. Now for the third cycle of three injections, we started upping the dose. So now we're going to 7.5 milligrams malfalan. So with 7.5 milligrams, we're getting swelling, we gave topical oral steroids, and we were getting third and sixth nerve palsies. But that Irritating tumor still came back after five months. So then we shifted from using malflan to carboplatin and topotecan and used three injections. So this patient's had three injections of intra-arterial chemo chemotherapy. And this has now been effective for 20 months. The patient has retained vision um, you can see, if you look at the macula, it looks um, reasonably healthy, but the, this is the only eye retained vision. We've got third and sixth nerve palsies, and we have enophthalmos. But interestingly, we have a scleral conjunctival ischemia, and this is an anterior segment um, fluorescein, showing that if you're giving this level of chemotherapy, you are going to get complications. But fortunately for this child, the vision has held. So that concludes my talk. Thank you to the All India Ophthalmological Society for inviting me to give this talk. I'd like to thank our team in London, especially um, Mandeep Sagu, who works with me treating retinoblastoma in the south of England. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Your, your experience is vast, and we appreciate uh, the information that you shared with us on intra-arterial chemotherapy. 
Um, our next speaker will be Dr. Francis Mounier from uh, Switzerland. He will speak on how do I manage vitreous. Oh, first, we'll have a question, right, Santosh? Mm -hmm. We'll do a question first and then Dr. Mounier's presentation. If we get unmute, Dr. Hanavar. Yeah, okay. Francis, can you just stop sharing for a minute? Otherwise, maybe you can go on. Okay, I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mounier has been a, an enormous contributor to our knowledge of retinoblastoma management. And one of his single biggest contributions to the entire world was the courage to inject chemotherapy into the vitreous cavity. So we're all ever so grateful to all his contributions. And today he will speak to us on the topic of how do I manage vitreous seeds from retinoblastoma? Dr. Mounier? Thank you, Carol, for, for your kind words. Actually, warm greetings from, from Switzerland to all of you. Special thanks to uh, Santosh and uh, All India Ophthalmological Society for organizing the meeting. I'm very pr proud, actually, to, to be uh, here with you. Also, uh, uh, special greetings to my, all my Indian friends all across India. So uh, I will now share my uh, experience regarding uh, vitreous uh, seeds. So this is the scheme of my talk. Uh, I will go through these different different topics. Your slides are not showing, Francis. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, we can, can hear, hear you. Very well, but the PowerPoint is not showing. Turn are on your one? PowerPoint. It's it, not turned on? No, it is the internet. Uh, I think Google is being shared, uh, Dr. Munir. You might have to go to your uh, Yeah. Go to your screen, oh. find your PowerPoint, and open it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Is it is it now here? Yeah, perfect, perfect. You see it? Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. So this is again the scheme of my talk. Oh, it doesn't work now. Why? I cannot progress. Is is that your oh, last yes. slide? Okay. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. So this is uh, all the topics I will go through. Just to remind you that we have actually three types of seeding: the dust, the spheres, and the clouds. I will go back to that because it has importance in terms of, of uh, how you treat and the number of cycles you give. Now, when it comes to intravitreal uh, uh, chemotherapy, it's important to just realize what we are targeting. We are targeting both vitreous seeding, uh, which is just mi migration of, of tumor cells in the vitreous cavity, but we are also, uh, with a similar efficacy, targeting sub yellowed seeding uh, as, as shown on the uh, inferior part of the, of the screen. And as you know, um, this, this is actually a cloud uh, in the sub yellow space blocked by the uh, vitreous base at the margin, as you can see here on the bottom uh, right image, uh, Fudus image. Now, uh, and, and I, you have two examples here, one is on the on the left, uh, the seeding in the in the vitreous, and on the right, it's a cloud in the vitreous. But you have also a sub real seeding with actually a seeding covering uh, the optic nerve head. So uh, I am a fan of two two particular tools, and I I think they are extremely helpful in the in the management of these uh, cases. One is OCT. Uh, as al already highlighted by, by uh, Santosh and uh, Karp, and ultrasonic biomicroscopy. So uh, I'm using the FLEX, idle, idle FLEX, which allows you to perform the OCT in a supine position. And uh, I have the Adiso for the 50 megahertz uh, um, uh, OCT, um, UBM, sorry. So of particular interest, OCT is to diagnose and monitor the epipapillary seeds. We have detected tens of such cases, and usually 
the seeds on the top of the optic nerve head or in the cup, optic cup, are invisible seeds. And if you don't detect them early enough, they will start growing in the cup. And then you will have, you cannot deal, you cannot treat to get rid of this seed just with intravitreal injection. You will have to also add um, intra-arterial chemotherapy. So this is imp of importance. It's also important to monitor the seeding response uh, to intravitreal chemotherapy. We do see in this um, following injection in the vitreous, a fragmentation of the seeds and an increase uh, of reflectivity, uh, which is typical of a complete response, allowing you to, to stop injecting in, in the eyes. Now for regarding ultrasonic biomicroscopy, I think it's very important to be able to, de to detect a trans yellowed migration of the, of the vitreous seeds. And we have seen this also tens of times. And of course, the, your therapeutic strategy was, will be totally different if you have seeds in the aqueous. Now, I will not uh, put too, mu too much emphasis on the technique. It's well known and, and, and uh, adopted uh, widely. Uh, consisting of an anti-reflux um, procedure with uh, cryocoagulation of the entricyte to destroy the tumor cells. Now, here's my regimen, a number of uh, injection for dust. I do now two injections. So I reduced a lot compared to my initial paper where I, I used to inject a double of injection for this. And for spheres, three injections and clouds, four injections. We have actually two drugs at disposition to do that. We can combine them also uh, in case of resistance. And, and, and uh, um, Carol was the first to, to combine these two drugs for uh, resistance uh, vitreous seeds. For melphalan, we have at present two uh, uh, specialties on the market, uh, Alcaron, the historical one, and Evomela, which is uh, uh, the, uh, also melphalan, but without the alcohol, without the propylene glycol that is used to dilute, to prepare the, the solution for injection, for the injection, and the topoteca. So this is the type of result that we can obtain, of course, combining here, of course, also with intraarterial. Here, uh, a double cloud, a cloud under the yellowed, and a cloud in the vitreous, uh, final result a detachment at some point where to, to buckle the, uh, the eye. These are other examples of success that we can reach with a combination of intravenous and intraarterial uh, chemotherapy. Now, I will touch briefly this. Efficacy, we, it's close to 100% honestly with melphalan. Using the appropriate dose, we are now close to a thousand injections in more than 200 eyes. And uh, I had uh, probably two eyes only where I had to combine with Topotecan. Uh, this is also this um, unprecedented efficacy has been also reported by a group of Carol and in, also in, in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles. Now, topotecan, we don't know uh, presently if this is equally efficient as melphalan, but we have very good news from India, actually, because uh, uh, Santos Group and Dr. Rao published two years ago, um, complete response is 17 eyes, uh, in all the 17 eyes injected with topotecan, with, um, very, which is a very promising result. Now, what about toxicity, we are dealing uh, with a severe, potentially severe and site threatening toxicity uh, caused by this melphalan induced retinopathy in some 40% of the eyes. We, it appears that there is virtually no uh, retinopathy uh, caused by topotecan, but this is also a little bit early to, uh, to know for sure now, in uh, Europe, uh, we have a European 
Euro, uh, European uh, retinal blastoma group launching this uh, uh, prospective uh, international phase two trial, randomizing melphalan and topotecan for intravitreous retinal blastoma. And we'll hopefully answer the question of uh, the efficacy, comparing efficacy and uh, the toxicity. Now, I come back shortly because it's a big concern about retinal toxicity. So we can grade this toxicity one to five. Five is a total, uh, I would say, retinal uh, necrosis with a uh, 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 pan-retinal um, uh, uh, reaction. Uh, I think there are two things that are very important to keep in mind, limiting, if not avoiding, the uh, severity of this toxicity. Uh, one is to avoid the para, what I call the paravitreous injections. I will just come back to that in a second. And, se and uh, secondly, to keep the effective intravitreous concentration lower than 10 microgram per ml. So this is pictures that I owe to uh, Tero Kivela, who treated a, a, a newborn for this um, para uh, papillary tumor in the papillar, papillary, uh, macular papillary bundle and injected in the vitreous just uh, behind the lens and caused this devastating uh, necrosis of the retina just at the back of the eye. And this is uh, because of the injection or in the Plockett's canal. Similarly, if you have a, a big retro yellow space, and believe me, if you do, if you perform a ultrasonographic 10 megahertz ultrasonography in your patients, you will notice, and all my colleagues will agree with me that virtually all patients have a posterior uh, yellow detachment. And if you happen to in inject in the retro yellow space, you will end up with a huge concentration and devastating effect on the retina. Now, regarding the importance to give the appropriate dose and to keep it at a secure level, you have to take into account two things, the growth of the child, so the age, mm -hmm. and you have to take into account the residual tumor volume, as you know, it can vary from if you have type four regression with flat scars. So the vitreous volume is, is just equal. There's no reduction by the tumor. But if you have calcified tumors, big calcified tumors, they can influence signif quite significantly the, the tumor, the vitreous volume and, the, and uh, thus the dose that you, you're supposed to eject to have the appropriate dose. So we have calculated this and we have found that uh, if you want, I've summarized that this is a, on the left, the ABAC for a type four regression. What you want is to keep the concentration, the effective intravitreal concentration between six and nine microgram per ml uh, to avoid, to, to have efficacy, at least six, and to avoid uh, severe toxicity at the retinal level. So below 10 and this is for uh, type four regression, and this is uh, on the right for uh, tumor volume, uh, residual tumor volume in the eye of 25%. So it's shifting, of course, the curves. And then I have summarized the uh, advised uh, dose you have to inject uh, according to age and um, um, residual tumor volume. So in summary, regarding my guidelines to reduce toxicity, uh, perf always perform a 10 megahertz ultrasonography to document the yellow status. Do the paracentesis uh, systematically under the microscope. Uh, uh, this allows you to inject a bigger volume in the vitreous and to use lower concentration and, and a better distribution of the drug. Uh, I use a 33 gauge needle uh, 12 millimeter long uh, at three, 3.5 millimeter from the limbus, usually 3.5. If, if I have a newborn, I will go to three, but never below 
to avoid uh, the, the complication at the level of the lens of the intersegment. And a long needle, which allows you to, to position the tip under the operating microscope just behind the lens in the center, far from the eye wall again, because you want to avoid the retinal toxicity and the toxicity at the level of the iris to avoid uveitis, to avoid uh, anti-segment um, uh, side effects, to avoid also paravitreal injection. And this can be simply obtained by observing the cloud formation under the microscope. If you inject slowly, you will see very clearly, if you focus correctly, you, you will see the, 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 your solution forming a cloud in the vitreous. For small eyes with actual lengths of 10, 19 millimeter, prefer 20 over 30 microgram of melphalan. Prefer also a meridian with a pre-existing chorioretinal scar. And importantly, reinject at the same meridian to prevent retinopathy extension. So you have more details in this publication that we just made in, uh, in this journal. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Mounier, for your uh, vast experience with uh, intravitreal injections and your tips on how to minimize uh, retinopathy. Those are all very important. And I will be sure to use these in my practice beginning next week. Thank you. You're welcome. Time for one question, Santosh. Uh, can we stop sharing the screen? Francis, uh, Francis can you stop sharing yes. the screen? Yes. Okay. Is correct? Yeah. Yeah, just before we go to the quiz question. Right. Are you able to see the screen now? Is my screen, screen seen? This update I just got from the All India Ophthalmological Society that when Francis was speaking, and even before that, there were 2,113 unique viewers who are watching the program from India and outside the country. So that's a big mm -hmm. number. And this is just on the uh, streaming. And of course, there are many viewers on YouTube Live and Facebook Live as well. So we are at this point in time going live yeah. for about 4,000 viewers, 4,000 ophthalmologists. Next question is uh, question number six. This is a picture from a movie, uh, Chariots of Fire, which featured an ophthalmologist and an ocular oncologist who popularized blood brachytherapy. So identify this individual. Who is this? Rootman, Ellsworth, Rees, or Stannard? Answer as question number six and the key of your choice. A, B, C, or D, don't write the name of the name. Thank you so much. Okay, so now that we've finished that question, um, our next speaker will be from India, Dr. Mahish Shanmugan. I have known Dr. Shanmugan for 25 years. We've been friends and we've seen each other at various meetings. He will speak on multimodal imaging and intraocular tumors, a new paradigm. Dr. Mahish. Can you all see my slides? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's a pleasure seeing you all, meeting you all this uh, afternoon or evening. And like, like Dr. Shields said, uh, it was in 1994. I visited Dr. Jerry and Dr. Carol for a short period of time. And it's my absolute privilege to be sharing this platform with her this evening. So let's look at multimodal imaging in, in chocolate tumors, the new paradigm. 
this it would be the format of the talk, considering that we have a diverse audience. So there'll be a slide which talks about the current standard of care as far as imaging is concerned, and then what new we are doing in these tumors. So we'll be dealing with retinoblastoma, uveal melanoma, vascular tumors, and lymphoma. Retinoblastoma, as soon as we see the child in the clinic, we would do an ultrasound to confirm the diagnosis and also advise a MRI. Earlier, we used to do CT scan, but MRI is the current standard of care. MRI confirms the diagnosis of the tumor and also tells us if there is any extra ocular extension, an extra steril tumor or invasion into the optic nerve. And more importantly, it also tells us if there is going to be a midline intracranial tumor or a metastasis to the CMS. White field imaging allows the follow-up of these patients. For instance, there's a tumor here. What happens to this tumor once we do the treatment is very well imaged by the white field imaging. And in select situations, we would be doing a fundus fluorescent angiogram as well. The fundus fluorescent angiogram tells us if if it's a residue or a recurrence of the tumor. If it's a residue, it will be staining with fluorescein, but if it's a reactivation of the tumor, it will show intrinsic vasculature which leaks. Dr. Munia showed the utility of UBM. So when there's an anterior retinoblastoma like what we see here, the anterior chamber is filled with seeds, we would be doing a UBM to see where the tumor is, whether it's involved in the CDD body and how much of past plana is involved. So what is new? So UBM, we saw Dr. Munir's presentation. He uses UBM in almost all the patients. So what does UBM tell us? In which part of the past plana it is safe to enter the eye? So if there is vitreous seeds close to the past plana, if there is a solid tumor, or if there's a retinal detachment, those are the areas you would want to avoid. But like you can make out all these, even in the absence of a UBM, a nicely dilated pupil and a good fundus examination will tell us where there are sparse vitreous seats and you can enter the vitreous cavity in that particular area. And this is a video which shows how we go about giving the intravitreal injection. And in addition to whatever cryotherapy we do, what I do is to give a subconnective distal water. Distal water is tumoricidal as far as retinoblastoma is concerned. So I have a modified technique of giving subconnective distal water as well as immersing the eye with distal water for about three minutes. What else is new is the utility of handheld OCT in retinoblastoma. So under GA, we can screen the eye with handheld OCT. The advantage is it identifies clinically invisible tumors. So for instance, we see a very small tumor here, which is less than a millimeter in size which would be extremely difficult to pick up on clinical examination. This is particularly useful when we are screening a child known to have a femoral retinoblastoma. So one eye may have an obvious tumor, the other eye, when we screen, it can pick up the such small tumors, which if they are very close to sensitive areas like the optic nerve head or the fovea, can be treated much, much earlier before it starts creating an issue. In addition, the OCT can show us if there is a recurrence within a scar a co-retinal scar post laser treatment or cryotherapy can be difficult to make out if it's a recurrence or it's a scar tissue itself. And the OCT can show us that if it is indeed a recurrence or not. And a perifoveal tumor like this. So we would be treating this with chemotherapy because we wouldn't be wanting to do any focally uh, destructive treatment like a laser treatment, which can have a deleterious effect on the vision. So these tumors, once they regress with chemotherapy, whether they're reactivating would be shown very well with the handheld OCT. And of course, the foveal integrity can be made out on the handheld OCT. I have no personal experience with the handheld OCT. Now let's move on to melanoma. The current standard of care is do an ultrasound in the clinic and an MRI. The ultrasound will show us if it's a dome-shaped or a mushroom-shaped lesion with low internal reflectivity, coronal excavation and optical shadowing. And the melanoma on the MRI will be hyper in T1 weighted image and a hypo in T2 weighted image. We would also be doing UBM if there is a ciliary body lesion like what we see here. It's a very small lesion which is involving the ciliary body, but then this was a full thickness uh, scleral invasion was there and the tumor was extending into the subconnectal space where we are doing a full thickness eye wall dissection. So the management decisions can be made out by the UBM imaging. So what is new as far as uveal melanoma is concerned? Mahesh? 
able to hear us? Yeah, that's better, Manish. I think the internet connection is a little unstable. Is better now? Yeah, yeah, much better. Okay, fine. So what we see here on the left side is a nevus. So we can see a defined posterior border, posterior margin of the lesion. But in contrast, this is a melanoma where we don't see the posterior extent of the lesion. So melanomas are thicker and more often on the OCT, we may not be able to see the posterior extent in the melanoma in contrast to a nevus. And uh, melanoma is usually associated with additional changes like the presence of subretinal fluid or interretinal fluid, which may be there in a nevus, but more commonly we do not see them. And the photoreceptor layer can be shaggy, which we can see here. This is a shaggy photoreceptor layer. So in the presence of subretinal fluid, interretinal fluid, shaggy photoreceptors, and the posterior border of the lesion not being seen, we would think a um, nevus is converting into a melanoma and probably needing a treatment. Here we see a coronal nevus, which cannot be seen as an elevated lesion on the ultrasound. But when we do an OCT, it looks like a slightly elevated lesion. So OCT is able to pick up a very subtle elevation, which may not be obvious on the ultrasound. What is important? These lesions, which have been shown to be elevated on OCT, but not on the ultrasound, have been shown to grow. So these lesions where we see an elevation on the OCT would have to be followed up closely because they are likely to grow. So here we see a vitrectomy and a biopsy of a tumor. So Greval et al. have published the use of an intraoperative OCT. Once again, I have no personal experience with an intraoperative OCT. Here they have found that like using an intraoperative OCT during the process of taking a biopsy makes it particularly safer. So here we can make out that the instrument which we are using to take a biopsy has cleared the retina has gone into the tumor and not too deep into the choroid but exactly within the lesion <laughs> and we can take a biopsy so this way an intraoperative oct during a biopsy can make it safer we have been working quite a bit on the optical coherence tomography angiography in tumors so with the octa as well we can differentiate between melanoma and nevus so here, what we see here is a melanoma, and this side is a nevus. Melanoma, the vasculature has an ill-defined margin. So we can see here it's an ill-defined margin, but in contrast, the nevus has a very well-defined margin. The choriocapillary layer is hyporeflective in a melanoma, whereas it is hyperreflective in a nevus. And there are areas of avascularity within the mass in melanoma. In contrast, in the nevus, the areas of vascularity are much lesser or not there at all. And there are choroidal vascular changes. You can see the network of vessels here, which are actually the tumor vessels in a melanoma, which once again, you will not see in a nevus. So this way we can differentiate between a melanoma and a nevus. And also when these changes begin to happen in the octa, you know that the nevus is converting into a melanoma. And the octa can also differentiate between melanoma and melanocytoma. Of course, uh, ocular oncologists can very easily make out, of, make out the difference between the two, but sometimes a melanocytoma can convert to a malignant lesion as well. So here we see the intrinsic tumor vasculature in the melanoma, but in contrast, a melanocytoma does not have any tumor vasculature at all. So is it easy to get these kind of images in all the octas? No, it is not. If you leave it to the machine to do an automatic segmentation, so this is the image you will get. So these were created by painstakingly doing a manual segmentation. So probably in the future, the machines may be able to afford an image like this without a manual segmentation, but the current Octa machines, you have to do a manual segmentation to look at the whole lesion in perspective. And you can see the beautiful vascularity in this lesion. Yet another thing we have found is like uh, the utility of the Octa in follow-up. So here we have a peripapillary tumor, which we treated with brachytherapy. And follow up, we are not too sure if the lesion is regressing or not. There seems to be some amount of regression, but we are not too sure. You do an octa in this, it shows the beautiful regression sequence. So the larger vessels have become narrower and the areas of avascularity are increasing. So this shows that like the brachytherapy, the radiation is working. And you can see this vascularity index also decreasing. So by doing an octa, we can predict which of the lesions are responding to our treatment much earlier before they start showing the signs like decrease in subretinal fluid or decrease in the size of the lesion. Tumor microvasculature in melanoma is known to be prognostic. On histopathology, we have shown that we have seen that like the 
multiple loops and anastomosis can be prognostic. And right now, we can see the tumor vasculature beautifully in octa in select situations if the tumor is not too elevated. But then, like over time, we should be able to look at these prognostic markers based on the octa itself. And maybe we will be able to prognosticate which particular melanoma is what has a potential to have a metastatic disease. We'll move on to vascular tumors. We have a solitary circumscribed choroidal hemangioma here. The usual uh, imaging we will do is a color photograph, fundus solution angiogram, and an ultrasound. And in the presence of a phacomatosis like a Sturge Weber syndrome, we will do a neuroimaging to see if there is any CNS involvement. What is new? So the optical coherence tomography in these lesions predicts visual recovery. For instance, this patient has been having this detachment for a long time. So we can see the ellipsoid layer is gone. There is schisis, there is interretinal cystoid spaces along with subretinal fluid. So we can predict that this patient post-treatment is going to have some limited visual recovery only. And this is post-treatment. We can see the subretinal fluid, the exudation, and the interretinal fluid is subsided. So that's another, op that's another indication for OCT. It tells us if the treatment has worked or not. And the OCT can also differentiate between hemangioma and melanoma. In hemangioma, the choroid capillaries are preserved, but in melanoma, they are invaded and the choroid capillary layer is not there. So in an amelanotic melanoma, which is mimicking a hemangioma, OCT can be a marker to say that what is what. So here we see a patient who has a nevus flimus on his face, but then the fundus looks almost normal. But when we have to turn on OCT, it shows that there is indeed a diffuse choroidal hemangioma. It has not resulted in any exudation. And the catsup appearance, catsup fundus appearance is also not very obvious, but the OCT shows that there is indeed a diffuse choroidal hemangioma. So this is the fundus appearance of the same patient, the right and the left eye. You can hardly make out if there is a tumor, but we do an octa. You can see this tumor vasculature beautifully. So the OCT and the octa tell us if there is indeed a very subtle choroidal hemangioma, diffuse choroidal hemangioma in such patients. Now, yet another thing we found is like these, these are three different circumcised choroidal hemangiomas, and these two are showing an associated exudate to retinal attachment, and this is an inactive tumor clinically. So what do we do when, what do we see when we do an octa? We see the areas of avascularity or more in an inactive tumor. So this tumor, which shows this hyperreflective mass of vessels and the like little increased areas of avascularity. And here you see gross avascularity. More the avascularity, more the signal void areas, these tumors are less likely to leak. So when we follow up a patient, when we're seeing a patient for the first time with a choroidal hemangioma, an octa can tell us which patient is likely to develop an exudative detachment in the follow-up period. So here is a patient who has who had an exudative retinal detachment and post-radiation, the detachment is uh, subsided. And these are the same changes which we see on the octa. So the areas of avascularity and the signal wide areas are increasing, indicating that this is indeed an indication. This is an indi indeed the sign to show that the treatment is working and these tumors are not going to leak in the future. Let's move on to the retinal hemangioblastomas. So usually you do a fundus fluorescein angiogram, which will identify the subtle tumors which are not seen on clinical examination, very small tumors, and then we go ahead and do a laser photocoagulation. And of course, like if it is a VHL or phacomatosis, we would do a neuroimaging, we would do an abdominal scan as well as a urinary catecholamine at a particular defined intervals to see if these patients are developing any other serious life-threatening diseases. Um, now coming on to the new paradigm, so here, here we see uh, a patient, like you can see small tumors in these two images, but in these two images, we can hardly see the tumor, isn't it? In this is the situation when we would do a fundus fluorescein angiogram. And we can do an octa and pick up this very subtle lesions. So the octa picks up clinically invisible lesions in this VHL disease. But the only limitation is we don't have a wide angle octa at the present moment. So we may have to do multiple quadrants, but with time we should be getting a wide angle octa and we can replace the fundus fluid angiogram with octa in this situation. So here we see a lesion in the peripapillary region. We are not too sure what it is. It's just an elevation. But we do an octa, we know that, that this is a vascular mass and con yeah. connected yeah. to the retina, yeah. so indicating that this is a juxtapapillary retinal capillary hemangioblastoma. So you can make out a, a peripapillary hemangioblastoma using an octa. This is an endophytic lesion. So here you see an exophytic lesion, which is beautifully outlined by the octa. Yeah. 
They are ready. Sometimes. Coming on to the primary vitreoretinal lymphoma, what we would usually do see. is to do a fundus photograph, mm -hmm. Lewis and angiogram, and the ultrasound, and as well as the CNS imaging. But of course, ultimately, what we would do is to do a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis of primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. But there is a new interesting paper which was published from London, which shows that like using an optical coherence tomography, we can diagnose the PVRL with great certainty just based on the images. So I borrowed an image, borrowed a photograph from this article. So what do we look for? These are the signs which you look for, discrete pre-RP nodules and irregular RP. And more importantly, the subretinal band. We see the subretinal band mm -hmm. of infiltrate. This is again, you see the subretinal band. So when we see the subretinal band, that is an indication that this patient is very likely to have a primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. Because you can have diffuse vitreous seeds, and there can be hyperreflective inner retina because of infiltration of the tumor into the retina. And also, along with that, there can be subretinal fluid, and CME is rare in PVR. And the PVRL can be differentiated from coronal lymphoma when we were to do the OCT. In the primary vitreoretinal lymphoma, the collection is between the RP and the but in, but in coronal lymphoma, all the collection is deep in the tubes. So by, by doing an OCT, we can see where the layer, where the infiltrates are and differentiate between PVRL and coronal lymphoma. So that to summarize, the multimodal imaging in intractable tumors aids in diagnosis. If we don't have any detect well, well, transformation well. earlier as in the nevus and assess treatment response and also prognos prognosticate on the vision. <laughs> Thank you very much once again to the AOS and Santosh for giving me this great <laughs> Thank you so much, Mahesh. That was a brilliant talk. Really enjoyed it and learned a lot from you. So thanks a lot. Uh, can I request all panel members to mute their screens uh, so there is no interference with the speakers, please, if you don't mind. It's on the left-hand side column. Uh, there's a mute button. If you could press mute, it'll uh, help uh, the speakers not get disturbed. Thank you. Um, we uh, are going to take a break from the quiz now, and I'm going to request Dr. Carol Shields to uh, give us the keynote lecture. Um, um, we all know Carol, she's one of the topmost oncologists in the world, and uh, um, we look forward to learning a lot from her. Thank you, Carol. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you see my slides? You're on, Carol. Thanks. Yes. So I serve on the uh, Science Advisory Board for our Biosciences and Immunocore. It is my great pleasure to speak to you today. And I'm trying to get my... It's not allowing me to go forward. I'm not sure why. Let me just do this. Ah, okay. I don't know what I did that made it go forward, but I'll speak to you today on the topic of uveal melanoma 2020. There's a lot going on in the field of melanoma. We have now new nevus risk factors predictive of transformation into melanoma. We have a new melanoma classification, thanks to the National Institute of Health, the NIH. And we also have a new melanoma treatment that's undergoing investigation by many centers in the United States, soon to be available in Europe and around the world. So let's begin with nevus risk factors, predictive of transformation into melanoma. How common is choroidal nevus? Well, from the Blue Mountain Eye Study in Australia, Archives of Ophthalmology, let me just change one thing here, I'm gonna go back. It was found that choroidal nevus is found in almost 7% of the white population. We did a similar study in the United States where we looked at the CDC and Haines database and we found choroidal nevus was occurred in about 5% of the US adult population. Personally, I think it's much higher than that because that study only focused on two 45 degree photographs in the macular region. 
Here's a spectrum of choroidal nevi. Some are small, some are pigmented, some are non-pigmented, and some are large and even giant in configuration. So how often does nevus transform into melanoma? Well, in the real world, it's fairly uncommon, but we just published in the journal Retina 2019, an analysis of 3,800 cases of choroidal nevus that we followed on the oncology service at Wills, and we followed them for many years, looking at imaging risk factors that predicted transformation into melanoma. In this database, we found that 1% showed growth into melanoma by one year, 6% by five years, and 14% by 10 years. And the risk factors using multivariate analysis that were found to be significant included some factors that you already know about that were present in previous clinical analyses. We remember these risk factors now, the most recent risk factors, by this mnemonic, too fine, small ocular melanoma doing imaging, where it represents letters TFSOM, DIM. And these represent variables, T for thickness, F for fluid, fluid on OCT, thickness on ultrasound, S for symptoms of vision loss by the vision chart, O for orange pigment on autofluorescence, M for melanoma hollow on ultrasound and DIM for diameter greater than five millimeters by photography. This is actually quite important because these risk factors are very significant in predicting growth. You can see thickness has a very high hazard ratio, fluid greater than three and orange pigment greater than three hazard ratio. And if a patient has any one of these risk factors, there's an 11% mean chance for growth using Kaplan-Meier analysis by five years. If a patient has any two risk factors, it's a 22% rate of growth. And kind of the cut point is if they have four or more risk factors, any four, the mean rate of growth at five years is over 50%. So nowadays, if a patient has three or four of these risk factors, we're a little more prone to intervene early rather than waiting for growth because it's a high rate of growth. So let's look at one case in point. This patient has a 6.5 millimeter flat choroidal lesion with obvious orange pigment overlying it. And if we look at our risk factors, there's five of six positive risk factors. This is, we see that the thickness is under two millimeters but you can see on OCT, there's subretinal fluid and we have additional shaggy photoreceptors. And on autofluorescence, we can clearly discern the orange pigment. And on ultrasound, we can see this is a hollow mass. This is a 30 year old man and his score was five risk factors positive. Looking at the five-year Kaplan-Meier growth rate, that's a 55% rate of growth and with a 26 hazard ratio. This is a patient that we would treat early rather than waiting for growth. Lauren Dalvin, who's now chief of ocular oncology at Mayo Clinic, when she did her fellowship with us, she took these six risk factors and looked at every single combination of risk factors predictive of transformation of nevus into melanoma. And she made what's called a heat map where those that are orange or red have the highest risk for transformation into melanoma. And those that are blue or green have the lowest risk for transformation. And you can see on this heat map, there are several combinations of risk factors that have up to 100% five-year rate. We think this heat map will play into the future of artificial intelligence for detection of small melanoma. And rather than saying that the nevus is high risk or low risk, maybe we'll have a score of zero to 100 based on these combinations of risk factors, based on the percent risk for growth by five years. So no more guessing or wait and watching. Let's be smart about it. Let's use risk factors to score a nevus like this high risk nevus, and let's use smart science. Next topic I'd like to talk about is a new melanoma classification. Most of us are doing 
tumor genetics, where we do a sampling with fine needle aspiration biopsy into the tumor. And using DNA or RNA analysis, we find the cytogenetics or the gene expression profiling. And if we have chromosome three or eight mutated, or we have a class two RNA gene, gene expression profiling, that's classified as high risk for metastatic melanoma. Well, the team at the NIH, at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, they, the same group that looked at the human genome looked at the Cancer Genome Atlas project. And they said, we, can, we all contributed, and there were many people around the United States and the world who contributed to this project. They looked at 80 cases with a multi-platform molecular analysis, and they came up with basically four groups that were distinct in their cytogenetic profile and their prognosis. They were based on the presence or absence of disomy of chromosome three. So group one was called class A, group two, class B, group three, class C, and group four, class D, with increasing risk for metastatic disease. But they only studied 80 cases. So Dr. Vishivai Paisel, when in fellowship with us, he with Lauren Dalvin and our team, went and dug up 658 consecutive patients with uveal melanoma, and we applied the Cancer Genome Atlas to our cohort to see if it really was predictive of rate of metastasis. And the answer is, it is highly predictive of metastatic disease. So here are our results in 658 patients. We think A was the most common class. That's good news, most low grade. That represented 52% of our series, and that only carried a 3% risk for metastatic disease at four years. Class B with disomy 3 and 8Q gain represented 14% of our cohort, and that had a 10% risk for METs at four years. Class C was monosomy 3, 8Q gain, representing 18% of our group, and that had a 25% rate of metastasis by four years. And class D, the highest risk, monosomy 3 and 8Q gain multiple, had a 41% rate of growth by four years, and this was statistically significant. And seen in table format, you can see class A, again, disomy 3, disomy 8, low risk for METs. Class B, disomy 3, 8Q gain, slightly higher risk. Class C, when monosomy enters the picture with 8Q gain, higher risk. And class D, when you have monosomy 3 and multiple 8Q gains, highest risk, 41% by four years. So now in our records, every, patient's with you, every patient with uveal melanoma gets the Cancer Genome Atlas classification. It's very simple, it's easy to understand, it's highly predictive, and we use this now in selecting out high-risk patients for adjuvant therapies. So last, I'd like to talk to you about melanoma treatment. I think all of us are familiar with the options in melanoma therapy, enucleation, radiation, local resection, and others. We tend to use plaque radiotherapy in Philadelphia. You can see this nine millimeter tumor had a beautiful response to plaque radiation, 98% local control. So we have a good ophthalmic response, but there are problems with plaque radiation. The problems include radiation retinopathy, papillopathy, choroidopathy, and others. We've already heard from Dr. Paul Finger, who has explained his philosophy, and we believe in what he has said. We believe that it's time for us to rethink how we can reduce these complications. So we just published in JAMA Ophthalmology, I think a really important report. We looked at visual outcome at four years following plaque radiation for uveal melanoma in which we gave prophylactic bevacizumab. I'm not saying therapeutic. I'm saying we gave prophylactic to prevent radiation retinopathy. And we found in this study, again, it was bevacizumab Q4 months for two years. 
we found this prophylactic bevacizumab at one year, the bevacizumab group had a mean visual acuity of 20 over 40 compared to a mean of 2060 in those who were control, didn't receive any injection. And at two years, while we were still giving prophylactic bevacizumab, the rate of vision was 2050 in the bevacizumab group versus 2100 in the control group. Then we stopped giving bevacizumab, but we still found significance at years three and four. At year three, it was 2060 versus 2200. And at year four, we're off bevacizumab. We only gave two years of prophylactic injection. And in the bevacizumab group, the mean visual acuity was 2070 versus counting fingers. So this is very important information. And we're now working with the DRCR, which is a diabetic retinopathy uh, collaborative research group to do a prospective study on this topic. I'd like to say a few words about a new uh, therapy called ARA011 nanoparticle therapy. It's currently in phase 1B2 study. It's used for small melanoma, less than 3.5 millimeters in thickness. We have about eight centers in the United States and there'll be several centers around the world in Europe and in Australia, looking at this new melanoma therapy. Basically, this is a viral-like nanoparticle that's injected through the pars plana into the vitreous. These nanoparticles are attracted to heparin sulfate that coat melanoma cells. It's coupled with a photosensitive dye so that when we shine laser light, it causes immediate necrosis of the tumor. This was approved by the FDA in March, 2017. We treated the first two patients here at Wills uh, actually, both patients did well, and there are several centers around the world now. We have two-year data in. Vision preservation is good. This is so unlike plaque radiotherapy or proton beam radiotherapy, where the vision starts to drop at two years. 92% of patients have vision preservation. Tumor control is fair. 65% of patients have complete tumor control. Of those that were showing evidence of growth, we have up to 90% tumor control. The main safety issue with this new nanoparticle therapy is inflammation in the anterior segment or the vit vitreous segment, but fortunately it responds to topical or injection of steroids. We're now moving forward with a new suprachoroidal delivery where we inject the medication into the choroid and we think we're gonna get better efficacy because we don't have to have the uh, medication go through the retina into the tumor, it's directly injected into the choroid, and then we shine the later laser light. I think we'll see higher efficacy with this new suprachoroidal delivery, and trials will be starting soon. Last, I'm just gonna cover two important medications that we're using for systemic therapy, uh, sunitinib and immunocore. Beginning with sunitinib, this was published in Ophthalmology 2017, Patients who have uveal melanoma and their genetic profile is high risk can benefit from sunitinib. On this graph, the red line represents those who re receive sunitinib. The blue line received no treatment. And you can see survival was higher, significantly higher in those who receive sunitinib for the prevention of metastatic melanoma. And there was a greater significant benefit in younger patients. Others have studied adjuvant dendritic vaccination in the Netherlands, showing that high-risk patients can respond to vaccination to prevent metastatic disease. And immunocore is currently our secret weapon for treatment of metastatic melanoma, and we hope to be using it soon for the prevention of metastatic melanoma. This is one of those fancy immune-modulated T cells against cancer, where we actually can find T cells and drag them into the melanoma to fight the melanoma using cell surface markers. We re-educate the T cells. So basically this is a bispecific molecule to find melanoma and T cells. The HLA-A2 receptor binds to the melanoma. Right now, currently the melanoma metastasis. And then the CD3 receptor draws in the T cell. So it brings the T cell right to the melanoma. It sounds unreal. It sounds, how can this work? But here's an example of a real live patient. 
We've now treated over 50 patients with this medication. We usually reserve it for patients with diffuse metastatic disease. She had over 30 metastases in her liver. You can see her liver here with all those bright spots representing metastatic disease. Just a few months after we gave her that medication, Immunocore, she showed complete resolution of all METs, and she's now greater than three years follow-up with no metastatic disease, all gone. She has to receive this medication every week. It's an infusion every week. That's no good, but at least we have a medication that might be strongly beneficial for patients with metastatic disease. Lots of work to do regarding that medication. Finally, we have pharmaceutical companies that are exploring targeted therapies for treatment and prevention of uveal melanoma metastasis. Now that we sort of understand the pathway to melanoma development. So in the past few minutes, we've discovered, we've discussed nevus risk factors. Remember the new mnemonic, using your imaging to find small ocular melanoma doing imaging. Use your ultrasound, use your OCT to find fluid, use your autofluorescence to find orange pigment. We've also discussed the new melanoma classification, the Cancer Genome Atlas classification. It's simple. Genetics are very difficult and challenging, but this simplifies our understanding of prognosis. And then last, a uh, new melanoma treatment that's currently on the horizon, R011 nanoparticle therapy. This is best for small melanoma, and we hope to improve its efficacy by delivery of the medication directly into the choroid to the tumor. Thank you, and that summarizes uveal melanoma 2020. Thank you, Dr. Shields, for a wonderful talk. Uh, are you going to stay with us for the questions? Because we have a lot of questions. Um, I have another meeting to go to. Could I take questions now or? We're just collecting questions because these are all online on various forums. Okay. So, yeah, I'm wondering if, if I can do it. Can I do it by phone? Yeah, you can even email them back. We'll give you email IDs as well. Okay, mm -hmm. that would be fine because I have a 10 o'clock appointment that I have to head to right now. I'm yeah. sorry. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. While Sachin gets ready, I'll have a couple of quiz questions. Can you unshare, please? Yep. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Stop share. Okay. Uh, we, we have a couple of quiz questions coming up. Uh, this is question seven. This is OCT, identify this particular lesion. Hemangioblastoma, retinoblastoma, granuloma, astrocytoma. Answer should be sent as seven with the key A, B, C, or D. Going on to question eight, this particular fundus condition you can see this patchy pigmentation. This was bilateral. It is associated with carcinoma lung and ovary, gastrointestinal malignancies, genitourinary tumors, all of the above. Thank you. Next, I invite Dr. Sachin Shal Salvi from Sheffield to speak on uh, what is new in orbital tumors 2020. Sachin. Thanks, Santosh. Uh, you're going to need to give me one second uh, to get my screen going. Right, is it is it on? Yep. Can you see my um, my PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, that's perfect. Right. Okay. okay, so firstly, thank you so much, Santosh, for inviting me uh, to uh, join in this webinar. And a lovely hello to all my friends across India, across the world. And namaste to all my uh, friends in India and everyone who's joined the webinar. So Santosh has given me a, a, a talk uh, for 12 minutes to talk about a bit about advances in orbital tumor. Um, and what I thought I'll do is, what is it that I'm do now doing, especially with the changes that I'm having to make with the COVID-19 situation? 
So rather than rattle through a lot of new advances that have been done that you can read it in the books, um, Santosh has uh, written a fantastic review on recent orbital uh, tumor management. Uh, you can read that or, and so there's lots of online information available. I'm also not going to touch base on things that by now are well known to everyone, including use of propranolol um, I'm not going to touch base on, say, the chemo rate reduction used by or, or uh, made popular by Santosh um, in lacrimal gland ECCs uh, rather than major surgery. Uh, I'm also not going to touch on, say, things like 3D, uh, you know, use of 3D in orbital surgery. It's more of a gimmick, I find, rather than actual uh, clinical benefit. So what I thought is I'm just going to touch base on four to five things that I think I've started doing differently. And I suspect with the COVID-19 being with us for quite some time, things that we'll have to do differently. And so first thing I want to talk about is uh, diagnostic biopsies. So rather than big, big biopsies, I've sort of moved towards CT guided orbital biopsies. And I'll talk about the advantages of that. A couple of things about how uh, you know, as an orbital surgeon, everyone presumes that you're doing big, big, massive surgeries, and that really does excite me, you know, and I enjoy doing the bigger operations and doing a lot of exenterations and uh, complex reconstructions and uh, trauma management. But what I'm finding is that increasingly for tumors, I'm using non-surgical modalities such as stereotactic proton beam therapy, chemo reductions. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll also talk a little bit about art at surgery, uh, what are the newer things that we're doing, such as using navigation system and customized implants? So um, this is the remit for my talk. So there's nothing else to sort of go through other than just enjoy the rest of the slideshow. There's not much more information other than what I've given on this slide. So how do I do CT guided biopsies? Uh, well, basically it's very simple. Uh, I give a peribulbar block. I use a Temno needle. Um, uh, it's a core biopsy needle. Patient. Uh, with a orbital tumor, preferably lateral or superolateral area. Um, usually these are elderly patients with metastasis. Rather than performing big surgeries under general anesthesia to get a small or to get a sample, I find that just passing a needle under CT guidance is adequate and gives me significantly uh, good results with reduced patient morbidity. Um, for obviously, if the tumor, say a lymphoma is anterior orbital, you don't need CT guided, but these are more deeper tumors. So patient is taken to a, uh, after the block, patient is taken to a CT scanner, a CT scan is taken. Uh, under the CT guidance, you actually pass in this uh, core biopsy needle. Uh, you take another image with the CT, which shows exactly that or confirms that the tumor is, um, uh, the needle is passed into the tumor. And then you, you fire the needle, which gives you a nice core biopsy of the tumor. A um, couple of cases. So this is a 72-year-old gentleman with a um, lesion superolaterally in his orbit. And you can see the crenated orbital rim suggesting this most likely is quite an aggressive tumor, um, rapidly growing. And rather than sort of a big anterior orbit autonomy, we performed a CT guard biopsy, uh, as shown in this figure. And to confirms metastatic prostate adenocarcinoma. So uh, we could then do a surveillance, uh, we could do a staging a further treat and further treatment directly uh, from this point. Another patient, 90 year old lady, um, big tumor in her left orbit causing restriction of eye movement, uh, a core needle biopsy, CT guided was done, which shows a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Another 84, 84 year old patient with a uh, lateral rectus mass uh, which on biopsy uh, was confirmed to be a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. Um, this is a non-cancerous patient, bilateral um, orb orbital inflammation. Again, it does help uh, in these cases as well, confirming that this is not cancerous, but more an inflammatory process, which we could then manage appropriately. So the reason I'm showing you these slides is that Really, um, we're finding it difficult. I mean, personally, with the COVID-19 situation, taking a cancer patient to theater, it's taking three times the amount of normal theater time. Uh, it, most of my patients are elderly, and um, it really means that if I can get them done under local anesthetic, under the CT-guided um, uh, mechanism, 
biopsy procedure itself is safe, gives me enough tissue sample, it may not be successful in bony lesions, but in the rest of the soft tissue lesions is really useful. And certainly because we can do this as a non aerosol generating procedure by avoiding general anesthesia, avoiding major surgery, uh, doing it as a day case, uh, and also that because it's only a small entry point, I don't have to wait for the wound to heal before commencing radiotherapy or appropriate treatment. This is slowly becoming a, a, a go-to mechanism for suspected orbital tumors um, for me for a biopsy procedure. Uh, that was the first concept. The second concept I'm thinking and increasingly, I think um, a couple of speakers alluded to it, um, is you know use of adjuvant radiotherapy uh, so I'm going to touch base on conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, this is just for the general ophthalmologist. The aim of any ocular tumor is to treat the cancer. Obviously, why do you want to treat the cancer? To prevent local progression, to reduce the risk of systemic spread and death. But also when we're treating them, we want to try and preserve their vision. And if possible, also retain or improve their cosmesis uh, by managing the tumor. So we've already talked about conjunctival squamous cell carcinomas. Majority of them fall in the uh, you know the, the lower TNM classification. Uh, we we grade all cancers with uh, AJCC currently eighth edition, and what we find is that um, ma majority of them are T1, T2, and they can be managed as Carol said with topical um, chemotherapy, immunotherapies, or surgically uh, as Santosh said. But there is a high risk of local recurrence, and. But the good news with the conjunctal SCCs is that the risk of metastasis is much low compared to the sebaceous glands that Peru's talked about. So the risk of metastasis is only 8% in a T4 disease, uh, which T4 is orbital involvement, and mortality is around 1%. So that comes to the next point. I mean, dominantly, we used to do exenteration surgeries for orbital involving squamous cell carcinomas. And obviously, it, it has its role uh, in really aggressive or the uh, uh, or tumors that are very poorly differentiated. But a tumor that is well differentiated, do you really want to consider exenteration surgery when the risk of uh, you know mortality is one percent? Could you look at alternative treatment options in them by treating the tumor, getting on top of the tumor? And that's where the idea of stereotactic radio surgery in treating these anterior orbital extensions from SCC came from. So again, a peribulbar block is given in these. You put a frame around the patient's head, um, patient's taken into a scanner, which then the MRI shows the tumor, which you then uh, go through and then decide, you know, the, the, the area that you want to target and cover. Patient then is the, then back into the uh, stereotactic machine where radiotherapy is delivered. Um, the advantage of stereotactic radio surgery is that the beams go from 360 degrees around the tumor. So the entry point is different, um, hence the, uh, the, the area of radiation uh, being spread at th around 360 degree, there's lesser radiation side effects. And that way treatment can be delivered in literally 35 to 40 minutes. We do use a single shot treatment so patient doesn't have to keep coming back um, and I'll show you some examples. This is a conjunctival SCC, um, which initially did show mild anterior orbital invasion, which we debulked, excision cryomniotic membrane graft, but the, uh, that's an SC, a moderately differentiated SCC. But the MRI did show there was residual disease in the orbit. So we then elected to do stereotactic radio surgery. And this is really good news that five years down the line, there is no evidence of local recurrence and systemically as well, there is uh, no evidence of systemic disease. Um, so we're getting really good results with using stereotactic. So another patient, bilateral disease, again, I mean, you can't really consider exenteration surgery in these patients because you know you, what happens, the left eye is worse, what happens if the right eye gets worse? So we again did the standard uh, excision cryoamnetic membrane, tiferon injection, and um, confirming what grade this uh, disease is. And um, despite uh, of our excision, there was anterior orbital disease. So we proceeded with stereotactic radio surgery. So she's doing really well post stereotactic, um, three and a half, four years down the line, but the other eye is now getting worse and we might have to do same stereotactic treatment for the other eye as well. So, so the second concept I'm getting at is that, you know, you can and you should think about uh, adjuvant or, or treatments uh, with stereotactic radio surgery as an alternative to exenteration surgery, mainly in anterior orbital invasions from conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma. It certainly is less morbid, 
allows patients to maintain the vision. And uh, it, is, it is useful in the uh, well differentiated or moderately differentiated tumors, but obviously not so much in the really poorly aggressive uh, tumors. Um, third concept, um, again, dealing with a non-surgical management. Um, uh, this sort of is pretty much well known now, a rhabdomyosarcoma as a multimodality treatment. So it's a rare malignancy. Um, this, I'm just going to present a case of an eight-year-old girl who presented with sudden onset pain, proptosis, hypertrophia. Her vision is excellent. And what you find is that there's a big orbital mass in the left orbit. Um, sorry about that. So... How do, we, how do we now deal with this tumor? Well, rather than go in and debulk the tumor, because quite often you find that the tumor in, in cases of vital structures, a, a small biopsy is done, confirming this uh, uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, then the oncologist gives steroid injection and treat it with chemotherapy, uh, followed by proton beam therapy. And this patient has had a fantastic complete response and is in first remission uh, with no evidence of recurrence. They do get side effects of the radiation treatment. She's got quite you know, marked complaints of dry eyes for which she's on topical lubricants, but, uh, but we managed to you know, preserve her vision, preserve her cosmesis and get rid of the tumor with this multimodality treatment, giving us um, excellent outcome in this fashion. So, you know, my, my take on this is you really have to involve your oncologist, your colleagues, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's an MDT setup you need when dealing with orbital tumors. And uh, I avoid radical debulking, especially if it involves critical structures. Obviously, if it's a fungating mass, which is, can be easily debulked without damaging the muscles, globe, and other structures, that's fine. We avoid exenteration surgery, and the biopsy is definitely done because that guides our treatment and also gives us an idea of the prognosis. And with this, we've significantly improved the long-term outcomes of these patients. A couple more concepts, and these are more to do with surgery. Um, so yeah, I mean, you don't need navigation system in every orbital case, but for the really deep orbital tumors or in, an, in, in sort of small tumors, a navigation system works very well. I mean, it's a GPS concept. We all use our phones uh, guiding us where to go. So this is more an image guided surgery. And what it allows, it gives us continuous instrument tracking. Uh, 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 once you've fed in the information into the navigation system, that can be read out as a real-time display. So I'll give you an example of this uh, young lady who had a um, malignant rare medial epithelioma who we, you know, monitoring with surveillance. And at one of her repeat scans, what we found is that there is a uh, uh, a lesion which is extending from the orbital apex into the cavernous sinus. Now, how do you take a biopsy of that? Because obviously we want to know whether this is inflammation or whether this is recurrence of the tumor. How do you do a biopsy without navigation system? I mean, you could hit the internal carotid artery, you could hit any vital structure uh, while you go in. That's where navigation system comes in. I mean, that's this is not her images, but uh, just to explain how it's done, um, we uh, put in... Uh, a reference array is applied to the to the head. You can use a strip across the forehead as well, and then you effectively uh, read the facial structure of the patient, which is then input into the navigation system. That 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 uh, and th this works like a satellite in the sky, and then and then this book the 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 probe works like your sort of phone, um, uh, which gives you uh, your exact location once once you've reference array that patient. And then while operating, all you do is you apply the reference array and you know exactly where in the orbit you are. And this really, uh, I mean, it needs a little bit of familiarity and experience, but, uh, you know, pretty much it gets, it becomes second nature the more you start doing it and really is useful in these cases. I'll give you another example where I found it useful. This is a patient who has a skull-based meningioma that's been, you can tell from her left side of the head, that's really been uh, treated extensively before uh, with uh, bicoronal flaps and has had multiple um, reconstructions around that area, but she now has left proptosis, gradual worsening of her left vision. And this is because the meningioma, which was at the skull base, is now slowly started creeping into the anterior orbit. This, that's the MRI, which just shows where the location is. It's really a fine meningioma, which is pushing onto the optic nerve, causing proptosis and visual reduction. 
Um, so, and that's a CT, which again shows that she's had multiple reconstruction. There's bone missing, there's brain herniation further in. Um, you know, these are patients, I mean, how am I going to remove that tumor uh, without, you know, causing CSF leak, damaging to any of the vital structures? That's again, where the navigation system uh, really helps us. What we do is I do a 3D model, which again tells me where the bone is missing so that I can visualize or practice surgery on a dummy orbit before operating on the patient. And then intraoperatively, the navigation system actually tells me where exactly is the tumor. And then I can use what the neurosurgeons use is a, is a CUSA aspirator. It's like a phaco probe, which really gently just, you know, uh, really takes away, shaves away bits of the tumor very slowly uh, on the dura itself rather than having rather than causing punctures and uh, damage to the brain. So really there's certain uses to the navigation system. Uh, so as I said, I don't use it in every case, but really these small tumors, really in an awkward location, difficult tumors, previous surgery really is helpful. My last concept before um, uh, you know, we pass on to the next speaker is, is that of, that's a patient she's done really well. Um, my last concept is about customized implants. I mean, again, what we've done is we we do a lot of, uh, uh, we are a big trauma center, so we do customized peak implants or titanium implants. And what I've started doing is using some of those skills while treating orbital tumors. So this is a lady who had a superior temporal large orbital mass causing proptosis, limitation of eye movements, pain and inflammatory signs, and uh, she underwent surgical excision of this, which showed that this was actually an intermediate grade uh, solitary fibrous tumor. There's a low risk of metastasis with these. They're very rare, but, uh, but uh, what we do know is that they have a low risk of metastasis, and, but have a high risk of local recurrence. So um, we elected to not operate any further. They are radio resistant as well. So just monitor them. And lo and behold, a, uh, two or three years down the line, they, we can just about see the local recurrence that's happened in the lateral orbital wall. And that, this literally is on the, on the orbital bone. There's a definite margin towards the uh, towards the lateral rectus so what i what we felt is that well we need to get clear margins and that is the only way to try and reduce the risk of further recurrence i can get rid of the tumor from the soft tissue part but i can't really guarantee that the tumor will be removed in total from the lateral wall of the orbit so we elected to actually remove the tumor along with the lateral orbital wall um, and because we had planned this before, what we did was again uh, with our uh, ocular prosthetist um, anaplastologist, we uh, did a uh, we did a sort of a, a 3D printed model of a skull, um, got in a got in a titanium implant made to her lateral orbital wall. Uh, we made sure it fit the uh, skull with the, the 3D printed model, and that's what we used intraoperatively to recreate her lateral orbital rim. And uh, it did show that, yes, it was definitely a recurrence, but as you can see from the histology slide, uh, I think uh, Kastu probably will get excited about these. Um, they really shows that we've got clear margins by actually taking the bone away along with a part of the soft tissue around the tumor. So one year post-op, she's no recurrence um, and, and done very well with the use of um, this um, customized implant by removal of the lateral wall. So, I mean, things about orbital surgery is that you really have to be on top of your game. You need to have a good literature search, obviously respect patient wishes, but we see quite a lot of complex tumors and uh, really exenteration is not the answer to orbital tumors. You have to use multimodality treatment, use your colleagues, use your friends uh, to give you advice about uh, radiate therapy, oncology advice about immunotherapy, chemotherapy. And um, this is where sort of I see myself in 2020 working more as a team, more as a multidisciplinary team, learning from world experts such as Santosh about their experience really. You've got amazing number of cases in, you, in India um, and, and learning from each other is probably the way forward. So we touched all these five things um, over the last few minutes, as ma mainly, as I said, um, with the COVID-19, we're moving to more towards uh, avoiding GA, avoiding inpatient stay. CT guided helps us with that, mainly trying to do non-surgical treatments such as stereotactic proton beams, and at surgery in rare cases where uh, tumors are small using navigation system and customized implants. So um, I'm gonna end by uh, saying thank you to all. 
that's a photo from a year ago, Santosh. You probably remember we were in LA uh, enjoying ourselves. And that's a photo from today, uh, how times have changed um, over a period of a year. And it's great as a webinar, and it's great to see you, you know, uh, 4,000 miles away, Santosh. But I look forward to the day where we can enjoy ourselves uh, like the picture on the left again. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sachin. It was a wonderful overview on orbital tumors, and thank you for sharing your valuable experience here with us. Thank you. Uh, may I take this opportunity to uh, invite the next speaker? Uh, my, uh, it's a pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Vijayanand Reddy. Uh, before that, uh, we are going to take uh, question number nine from Dr. Santosh. Oh, unmute. Admin can, yeah. Okay, okay, I got it. So, uh, question number nine You see a child uh, with the open mouth and there are pigmented patches in the soft palate. This is what you see here. So, what is the ophthalmic association if you find a patient where the soft palate is pigmented? Uveal melanoma, choroidal hemangioma, lymphangioma, none of the above. That's question nine. We'll go on to question. Ten as well. Question ten: TTT was described by A. Shields, B. Singh, C. Horse, D. Galley. TTT or transpupillary thermotherapy was described by who was the person who described it? Shields, Singh, Ustahos, Galley. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. Uh, it's a pleasure to invite uh, my mentor, Dr. Vijayanand Reddy, who's the director of uh, Apollo Cancer Hospital, uh, Apollo Hospital in Hyderabad. Uh, Dr. Reddy is uh, one of those most eminent medical and radiation oncologists in India who understand and treats ocular tumors at its best. Uh, Dr. Reddy, uh, can we have you on the screen uh, with the presentation? Can you unmute him? Yeah, he's there. Hello. Are you able to hear me, Firoz? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. And uh, can I share my uh, screen? Yes, yeah, please. please. All right. And, uh, is it seen now? Yes. You're good uh, to thank you very much, Firoz, for the kind introduction. Um, and thank you, Santosh, for uh, inviting me for this webinar. I actually learned a lot listening to all the lectures. Uh, most of them were surgical topics, but it was quite interesting to listen to. Why is that I'm seeing only uh, Firuz here on the screen, not anybody else? Uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, Santosh asked me to speak a few uh, things what's happening in the chemotherapy front and uh, radiation oncology front. So briefly on that. Uh, the chemotherapy, target therapy, and immunotherapy. Uh, what we do, something different from the routine, what others do, uh, is that what I'm trying to focus here. Uh, most of them do not believe in uh, chemotherapy for locally advanced orbital and uh, orbital tumors. So we do that uh, quite regularly. We have to analyze our results, but uh, often I can certainly say that our results have been quite gratifying especially in advanced, locally advanced lacrimal gland carcinoma, where there is uh, inoperable upfront or there is an intracranial extension. We do uh, preoperative chemotherapy, three to, uh, two to three cycles, and then debulk it and then give post-op radiation, followed by uh, further three cycles of chemotherapy. Uh, similarly, meibonian gland carcinoma with the preauricular nodes, uh, inoperable upfront, but they have still uh, useful vision, and that kind of patients also we do do chemotherapy first and then uh, uh, re uh, reassess and operate and followed by radiation and chemotherapy. So no excentration, vision is intact and this is how the patients respond to chemotherapy and this is what uh, the end result is. New adjuvant chemotherapy, surgery with excentration and then post-op radiation treatment. So similarly, subvisual carcinoma with regional lymph nodes and these kind of patients also 
uh, we would do a new adjuvant chemotherapy. This patient had a preauricular lymph node, and this patient received chemotherapy followed by surgery and radiation treatment. Uh, we don't do unusual uh, chemotherapy drugs, and these are the drugs which are uh, which are already being used in hereditary malignancy, cisplatinum and uh, 5-fluoroacyl are the common drugs. Uh, in some patients, we do platinum and paclitaxel as well, uh, which is less toxic and easily tolerable to these patients. Uh, one of my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Sachin, was mentioning of RMS. RMS is quite a common tumor in our uh, scenario, and we do have, uh, we just do a biopsy and then followed up with chemotherapy and radiation wherever required. So we do see such kind of recurrent RMS. This is quite a challenging thing which Antosh would agree. Uh, these kind of patients, which uh, we would do salvage chemotherapy and off late uh, would like to uh, let you know that we started using uh, such kind of patient salvage chemotherapies. Look at the uh, gratifying response to uh, salvage chemotherapy. And we started uh, using re-radiation because of the techniques that we, these days, which are available to us. You look at the 100% uh, uh, dose uh, to the tumor and chasm, optic nerve and left eye are all quite uh, uh, easily spayed and this organ set risk are all completely spayed. And this is the end result. And if you look at the drugs, what we use in the salvage chemotherapy are gemcitabine and docetaxel. These are the drugs off late we started using and having a gratifying result. So otherwise, these round cell tumors, we know the standard treatment are VAD, VAC and iphosphamide retoposide. But off late after using gemcitabine and docetaxel, all these patients who have received earlier the standard chemotherapy have been responding quite well. This is after one year of follow-up. Orbital PNED is unlike other areas of PNED zimming sarcomas, although they are they look quite uh, destructive and deceptive in such massive tumors, they respond quite gratifying results. What we have seen with the standard chemotherapy drugs of ingression adrimis and cyclophosphamide, alternating with iphosphamide and and we normally use this for six cycles. That means almost 12 doses of chemotherapy which minimum of one year for younger age group or nine months for uh, for six to nine six to nine year old age group. So this is another this is a child which had such a massive tumor with intracranial extension did very well with post uh, chemotherapy radiation treatment and see the gratifying result what you've seen with the CT scan here. So this uh, this is after four years later she is doing quite well now it is after nine years later. This is one of the rare tumors uh, fibromyxoid sarcoma. Uh, although we know that this is not a chemosensitive tumor, on insistence by Santosh, we started the chemotherapy in this child and fortunately for the child, responded very well with iphosphamide and adrimycin and that we continued and then added local radiation at a later date. This is the 39 grain, 13 fractions with stereotactic radiation. Very small child, one year old, now is three, and three years old. Residual disease but with no activity on the pet is doing absolutely fine. So this is a child before and now, after a very active child at the age of three years, a little bit of a uh, uh, downward uh, uh, gauge, but this uh, uh, is doing absolutely fine with no activity in the tumor. Uh, and apart from these, there are no new drugs available as of now for the last one decade. Santosh wanted to stress on the new drugs. Unfortunately, no new chemotherapy drugs have come into the market. We're only juggling with the uh, drugs which are available and uh, that's the way it is. Targeted therapy, you know what is targeted therapy? is a molecular basis of oncogenesis is identified and each cancer of, of each cancer and a specific molecule is synthesized to block this pathway where there is a derangement of the pathway. So there are the off late, if you look at the molecular uh, treatment based on the molecular base, if you treat a cancer in a stage four lung cancer, which was never heard of, now it's almost two to five years survival, even in stage four, if you treat a patient based on the molecular uh, targets which are available on the tumor cell. So based on this, the target therapy is the way to go off late. See so many tumors, the first tumor which was cured or CML. Now, yeah, as far as hedonic uh, oncology is concerned, look at the melanoma is one of the areas where you use targeted therapy. But unfortunately, the bureau of mutation which is seen in a cutaneous melanoma is not often seen in uveal melanomas. So in a metastatic uveal melanoma, uh, you hardly have any BRAF mutation seen, so we can't use memorafenib. But as I mentioned, I was uh, uh, so interested to listen to Dr. Uh, Carol Shields. She was mentioning about uh, using sinitinib as an adjuvant to prevent metastasis. But I doubt, uh, I mean, I'm really gratifying results. That's what I've seen compared to the placebo. But 
Sinitinib is a quite a nasty drug. It has got a lot of side effects. Using sinitinib for an year or two to prevent metastasis is a little practically difficult scenario. However, we know that there's no chemotherapy drugs or immunotherapy drugs which are to be very uh, useful in metastatic uveal melanomas compared to the uh, cutaneous melanomas. So immunotherapy is more hype than reality. Uh, as of now, the may, three main cancers which are immunotherapy is useful against anti-PD, PDL1 and PD1, uh, carcinoma, lung, renal cell carcinoma, and metastatic melanoma. Again, metastatic melanoma and uveal melanomas, see the success achieved by a single anti-CTLA4 and anti-PDL1 and PDL1-2. The cutaneous melanomas have not been reciprocated in metastatic uveal melanomas. So that is unfortunate thing. Otherwise, the, this is the way to go forward what the new immunotherapy drugs can be of uh, help in metastatic melanomas. Few words about the what's happening new in the radiation department. We know we started with the conventional treatment. Now we have uh, IMRT, Rapidarc. I'll go briefly on those things. We know we moved from cobalt to linear accelerator where you have high, ener high energy, high precision and minimal side effects. So from 2D uh, RT, we had a conformal radiation. We can shape the shape of the beam. This is called 3D conformal radiation. So what is actually happened, the real revolution happened is IMRT. IMRT is nothing but intensity of radiation is modulated within the field of radiation. You can deliver radiation from 0, 40, 60, 100, 180. So within the field of radiation, you can modulate the uh, radiation dose of radiation delivered for example, 180 to 200 centigrade can be modulated within the field of radiation delivered to the patient. So this is how the intensity modulation radiation helps. Even within the target, if you have a normal structure that can be spayed and you can get the shape of the radiation uh, field and the dose to be delivered into the areas into a complex uh, target volumes. So now with the, apart from that, now when the patient is lying down on the couch, we have an X-rays and a CT scan to make sure that the exit and entry beams are absolutely going through for where we planned in the computer room away from the treatment position. So now we've got the couch, which is robotic movements, which moves in six to 12 directions. Make sure that the entry beam is exactly matching with the simulator, what we have done in, in another room when we do it on the patient exactly happening. Uh, that is called a simulator happening exactly on the patient when the treatment is going on. Again, the completely supervised, we have infrared cameras, even fraction of a moment of the patient, the treatment automatically stops. That is called image guided radiation treatment. So the entire treatment used to take earlier 12 to 15 minutes. Nowadays, it hardly takes 1.2 minutes. A high dose of radiation can be delivered dynamically while a patient is moving the treatment goes on. Bilateral retinoblastoma treatment delivered both the eyes in one minute and that's how the distribution happens. The, the uh, eyelids, cornea is completely spayed. Entire retina with one centimeter of the optic nerve is treated both sides simultaneously in a single go. This is the technology available these days. And see that this girl had to get married in two months time. The retinoblast, sorry, the rhabdomyosarcoma being treated and there's no trace of the disease in a rhabdomyosarcoma or NHL. No skin changes seen and no eyelashes lost. So there's another patient, young man, hemangioparasitoma has been again had a marriage in six months time has been treated with external beam radiation treatment. So the conjunctival lymph from one of the uh, speaker, Dr. Sachin was mentioning, we do quite a lot of treatments like that, the conjunctival lymphoma being treat, treated safely and there's a complete responses with this kind of a treatment. So there's no evidence of treatment on the skin, on the eyelids or eyelashes or at the end of the treatment. This is another interesting case where the patient had intraocular NHL, which was treated uh, in 2010. She had a recurrence in May 2013, again been treated in 2013, again had a recurrence in 2014, again treated with whole brain radiation. That is the beauty of the treatment with this uh, new technology, what is available. Look at this lady, cheerful at the end of the treatment. Um, from On five years, she's been maintained with intraocular lymphomas being treated twice and thrice. So lacrimal gland carcinoma is a nasty tumor, as we all know. Unless you deliver 6,600 centigrade, the recurrence chances are very, very high. Most often we see these patients being treated elsewhere with 4,500 to 5,000 centigrade, and they invariably land up in recurrences. 
so we safely can deliver such high doses in these tumors because of the technology and the expertise that we have these days the tumor therapy is another gadget where it is an external beam radiation where the rotation happens on the couch as well as on the uh, on the head of the uh, radiation machine so you can imagine 360 degrees rotation of the cow of the uh, the radiation head and the couch moving from head to toe simultaneously that means you can deliver the treatment from head to toe in one single go for example you have a craniospinal radiation for a csf positive patient you can be delivered in one single go or a patient with a brain tumor or a lung lesion with a liver metastasis can be treated in a one single go now of late is a proton proton therapy the greatest advantage of proton as you all know that this radiation will stop there is an exit beam of the standard linear accelerator that means at the exit you have around 20 to 30% of the dose delivered at the entry whereas the proton has the greatest advantage of delivering the entire dose in the target and after that there is no radiation absolutely zero so that is a great advantage when you are treating pediatric tumors and ocular tumors like retinoblastoma and melanoma so the stereotactic radiation is definitely definitely helping us in a big way because most of the tumors in the eye are less than 3 cm in size which is precisely being treated without harming the rest of the structures in the brain or near the orbit so stereotactically guided conformal radiation of the target in 1 to 2 sessions is called srs if you are treated in 5 to 20 treatments it's called stereotactic radiotherapy so you look, look at a lady of 40 56 year old lady with a choroidal metastatic disease single dose of radiation complete disappearance of the tumor there is no trace of the disease here and two years later she developed another lesion in the opposite choroid same lady been treated with external beam radiation stereotactic radiation with a complete response small lesions which are opaque orbital apex meningioma gallium dotanox can positive lesion if she is here see the dvh dose volume histogram 100% dose to the tumor and the critical structures would get whatever the dose tolerance that this can taken up orbital apex schwannoma again 18 year old female small lesion very close to the optic nerve exit of the uh, uh, optic nerve been treated with the radiation again see the dose volume histogram least dose possible and the tolerable doses to the normal structures and we get 99 to 100% control rate optic nerve glioma similarly stereotactic radiation see so the dvh here and then the solitary plasma cytoma of the right orbit this man is 72 year old 6 years before back we have treated is absolutely normal with us so solitary plasma cytoma without hurting his vision without as in retina is being treated comfortably a small metastatic lesion in the medial rectus muscle has been treated quite safely plaque brachytherapy as you all know the indications of plaque brachytherapy and this is what we use here with us is a ruthenium and the dosimetry is amazing you get almost 98 to 90 100% near the plaque and hardly 5% are few millimeters away from it retinoblastoma before and after and this ocular surface tumor and before and after the regression rates are extremely good quite gratifying 97 in choroidal hemangiomas oss in 82 retinoblastoma two thirds of the patient and almost 90 to 100% in uveal melanomas briefly about brachytherapy which is interstitial some of the cases as i was telling mentioning to you uh, lacrimal gland carcinomas they are halfly treated or uh, with 5000 centigrade they have residual lesions like this and we have wonderful team with dr santosh we do excision of that lesion and after that we place the uh, interstitial needles around the tumor bed this is how the tubes are placed and they are in place and the sutures are done and they are positioned in place and then these are the tubes which come out and they are connected to after loading sources and these sources are pumped into the areas where you want to deliver high dose of radiation to remind you these tumors have been treated by external beam radiation in the past elsewhere and we have again delivered reasonable doses to control these tumors and we have several such patients been done with interstitial brachytherapy we need to keep a keep a, very very careful on the radiation sequelae with this new and technology the sequelae have been quite less but because we are trying to do higher and higher doses we need to be careful on that to reduce the uh, dose to the retina and the optic nerve which are the most sensitive structures in these areas now we are able to spare the lacrimal gland uh, comfortably if you, if it is not a lacrimal gland tumor 
rest of the orbit can be treated safely, uh, reducing the dose of the lacking gland, the dryness can be spared much, much better. So as I said, we need to balance between the, uh, the dose to be delivered to the target and simultaneously uh, reducing the dose to the critical structures, then you will be able to achieve the best. What we need is a team and we need to have an excellent ophthalmologist along with an oncologist to work together, to work in tandem, when to intervene, when to give chemotherapy, when to do surgery, and what is the right time to add radiation to these patients, then the results would be definitely be optimal and that's the way to go. Our attitude at the time of diagnosing a patient should be good. Our attitude should be curative and then I'm sure we ideas would come out, work as a team, and the results would definitely be much, much better. Thank you very much, Santosh. Uh, thank you, uh, the rest of the team, for listening to my lecture patiently. Thank, thank you, Dr. Reddy, for a wonderful talk. Uh, now I invite uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Kaustub Mule, who heads the National Reporting Center for Ophthalmic Pathology at uh, CFS Hyderabad. We all, I'm sure, unanimously agree that uh, an ocular oncologist or a medical oncologist doesn't survive uh, without a pathologist. So here we have the most sporty and skilled pathologist who's going to take us through the ocular pathology today. Over to you, Dr. Kaustub. Thank you, Feroz. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I know it's time to say good night. Good morning in the US. Almost dinner time here. Just a while ago, I saw Dr. Reddy having his lunch and my gut started watering. Okay, so shall I share my screen? Okay. Can you see me? Can, can you see the screen, everyone? Not the yes. PowerPoint. The PowerPoint has to be open, Kaustup. Yeah, it's open. Can you see it now? No. 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 We see, see the main screen. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. No. Is this okay? No, no, it's the main screen, home screen. Yeah, I've opened it. Look, uh, when you share screen, click on the PowerPoint. Yeah, I did that. Do you want to try click once again? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Namrata and Dr. Santosh for having me share the screen with stalwarts in ocular oncology. It's a pleasure to be here. So ophthalmic pathology has come a long way in, in its six decade old history, right from uh, describing the gross anatomy of the eye to guiding therapy. Now with the use of modern tools such as molecular pathology, immunohistochemistry and digital pathology, we pathologists don't stop at making a diagnosis now. We prognosticate tumors and we also guide therapy. Now a lot of things have been covered by uh, previous speakers. And also, it is not the right time to get into detailed pathology. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through four different stories involving seven different people. So let's go to story one. Now the child at the top, he's a, he's a seven year old, while the one below him is a five year old. Now both of them had proptosis because of an orbital mass. What do you think is the probable diagnosis? Okay. It could be a lymphoma, it could be a myeloid sarcoma, it could be a rhabdomyosarcoma. What would you do next? You would do an incision biopsy, correct? Boom, this is what happened. So what do you think it is now? Right, green color. Which tumor gives a green color? Chlorella. Yeah. Correct, it's a granulocytic sarcoma. Now this is what the incision biopsy showed. It's a malignant brown cell tumor that was myeloperoxidase positive. So boom, your diagnosis is right. It's a granulocytic sarcoma. So what do you do next? You do a bone marrow evaluation. You do a peripheral smear evaluation. Now, these are characteristic or rod cells that you see in AML. Now, do you stop here? 
not anymore now let's take a look at this 7 year old child he had a 821 translocation while the child on your right he had a inversion of chromosome 3 now which of this child both were given similar treatments now what do you think happened to each of them now the 7 year old child who had a translocation 821 he survived the other one succumbed to disease why do you think this happened now there are certain important prognostic factors in acute myeloid leukemia the favorable ones are translocations involving chromosome 16 chromosome 821 and chromosome 1517 while there are a whole lot of them which are which have a unfavorable prognosis now detection of these cytogenetic abnormalities plays a very important role in prognostication of granulocytic sarcoma similarly genetic mutations such as uh presence of ntm1 and cbpa1 cbpa mutations have a favorable prognosis on the contrary mutations of flt3 tp53 rungs1 and ax asxl1 they have unfavorable prognosis now if flt3 uh, genetic mutations are present you can always always give protein kinase and tyrosine kinase inhibitors and their prognosis significantly improves Now let's come to the next story. This was a child who was eight years old. He had this clinical picture due because of her orbital mass. What do you think it is? Again, the same list of differential diagnoses: rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, lymphoma, granulocytic sarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, PNET. This is the next patient. He was an eleven-year-old child. Now he also had a similar mass. Now both these patients. had this clinical picture as a, a light microscopic picture what do you think it looks like yes it's a malignant small round cell tumor now this tumor was desmin positive myogenin positive which makes it what it makes it a rhabdomyosarcoma but if you go back it has a very alveolar pattern so this makes it a alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma now 60% of alveolar rhabdomyosarcomas they have a pax3 mutation whereas 20% have a pax7 foxo1 mutation now why is detection of these mutations important now children who um, children with rhabdomyosarcoma who have a pax3 foxo1 mutation they carry a poor prognosis as compared to those having a pax7 mutations in addition you know the treatment protocols for these patients can also be different hence just don't stop at diagnosis of it being a rhabdomyosarcoma embryonal or arms one go ahead do cytogenetic analysis and it will help you further better the prognosis in this patients story 3 now this lady was a 70 year old lady who presented with proptosis in her left eye because of an orbital mass the one on the right hand side was a 55 year old male who again had a orbital mass now this is what the light microscopic picture showed large angry looking cells they were cd20 positive which makes it yes it makes it a diffuse large b cell lymphoma now diffuse large b cell lymphoma is a very aggressive tumor but if appropriate treat treatment is given at the right time it has a great prognosis now immunophenotypically these dlbcls have been classified as abc and gcp types i will not get into the details of them now this lady she had a abc type of tumor while the uh, man had a gcb type of tumor now why is this important now a abc tumors they have only 45% five year survival whereas the gcb ones have a 90% five year survival in addition when we did cytogenetic analysis we found that the lady had a cmig gene rearrangement now what does that mean now what you usually do is in patients with dlbcl you first do immunohistochemistry chemistry and detect whether there is a presence of cmig and bcl2 gene abnormalities now if these are present you do fish analysis and see if there is only a mig analysis a mig rearrangement whether mig rearrangement in presence of bcl2 or bcl6 or all three are present this makes it a single hit double hit and a triple hit lymphoma now why is this important let's go back to the previous slide now the lady she survived while the man he succumbed to disease 
Now, triple hit lymphomas, they carry a poor prognosis as compared to the single hit lymphomas. They also have a greater chance of CNS involvement as compared to single hit lymphomas. Now, it has also been shown that single hit lymphomas, they respond to R-chop treatment, whereas the double hit and triple ones do not respond very well to R-chop treatments. In addition, they might need a R-epoch or a codox M treatment, which is given in Burkitt lymphomas. Hence, fish and immunohistochemical analysis of DLBCLs is very important. Okay, let's get on to the next story. Uh, this was a 70-year-old lady who had this mass involving the orbit and lacrimal gland region. What do you think it is? It could be an NSOID. It could be, be a IgG4 related disease. Okay. Sorry? Rosai Doffman. Yes, it could be a Rosai Doffman disease as well. So basically, it could be a lymphoproliferative or a fibroinflammatory disease. Now, this is what an incision biopsy showed. There's a lot of fibrosis, there's a lot of inflammation, some eosinophils. So very difficult to make a diagnosis on, immunos on light microscopy. Again, the same differential diagnosis. But when we did an ALK, the ALK came positive. Now, presence of this light microscopy in the presence of ALK positive positivity makes it what? It makes it an in inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. Now, why is detection of ALK important? Now, ALK rearrangements and overexpression is present in about 50% of IMTs. Now, why this helps is that ALK positive tumors, if they are given crizotinib, they respond very well because there is a small fraction of IMTs which can metastasize, which can locally invade, which can recur. Hence, it is very important to do uh, immunohistochemistry chemistry for ALK in these patients. Now, this is a PCR and a cytogenetic uh, analysis which shows inversion of chromosome 2 which led to ALK overexpression. Okay, now the last part something that has turned out to be very important in this COVID times, digital pathology. Now for us pathologists, this is something which is not very good. This is gonna take us, take the jobs away from us. So what is it? Is it a friend? Is it an enemy? I think it's a frenemy. Now sitting in one place, you know, someone else loads a slide somewhere in a scanner. I can always sit at home, make a diagnosis. Now there is there are certain data points that are you know, already fed into the computer, the computer will diagnose it. Now, there have been a lot of studies that have, you know, been performed, whether the computer is superior or whether the humans are superior. What do you think it is? Any guess? Well, neither the computer is superior nor the human is superior. It is the combination of the computer and the human that is more superior in making a diagnosis. So digital pathology with human mind is always the best. So with this, I conclude and I think I pass it to Vikas. Thank you, Dr. Santosh, once again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaustuk. Uh, uh, Dr. Santosh, do you want to uh, shoot the quiz questions? Yeah. Kaustuk, can you unshare your screen? Yes, yes, I'm doing it. I just have last two questions for the quiz. Is it okay? Yeah. Right. So this is question 11. This is primary intraocular lymphoma. Options for intravitreal injections are all except melphalan, 5-fluorouracil, methotrexate, or rituximab. Question 11, primary intraocular lymphoma, which drugs can be used except melphalan, 5-fluorouracil, methotrexate, or rituximab? Answer as 11, followed by your choice of key. We'll go to question 12. Who is credited with first? successful brachytherapy for UL melanoma. Question 12, who gets the credit for first successful clinical use of brachytherapy for UVL melanoma? Stallard, Dushman, Lomansha, Shields. Answer is 12 followed by your choice of key. That ends the quiz. We have more than 200 participants for the quiz, so it will take a while for us to collate all the responses.